I will call to order this meeting of the Board of Education of Region 12 uh, at 7 o'clock. Um, would you please uh, take the attendance? Sure. Uh, Joe Abdella. Not here. John Bonito. Greg Cava. Here. Victoria Salen. Here. Stephanie Polnick here. Angela Macchiarulo. Alex McNaughton, Here. Dustin Ongley, Ben Cody, Jane Sargent, Pete Tagley, Mary Weber. Okay, we have 11. Then. All right, at this time, is there any public comment on matters on this evening's agenda? Yes. Sure. Go ahead. I'd like to comment on the video from November 6, 2023 Board of Ed meeting regarding the determining a cost schedule for selling livestock for the agri-science program. I'd like to propose that the livestock be transferred or sold to the Chapaug FFA. Then the sale of livestock becomes a part of the student organization with oversight by the advisors and agri-science director. Then the money raised would be put into the Chapaug FFA Student Activity Fund, allowing the FFA to determine where the money should be spent. This would allow for students to experience agribusiness management and prioritize spending to build a better FFA chapter. This would also align us with what other agri-science schools do with their animals. Then the upkeep and maintenance of these animals is paid for by the region budget, just as it is done with lease standards. Those expenses are justified as learning materials and educational expenses. The other benefit to the FFA organization owning these animals is that it removes the Board of Education's accountability to the sale of these animals. It also removes the community's attachment to the livestock. In the end, these animals should be referred to and treated as production livestock. Regardless of one's attachment or feeling towards any livestock in the agribusiness industry, if the animal doesn't make the cut, they are culled to make room for better show or production stock. In animal breeding, culling is removing or segregating animals from a breeding stock based on a specific undesirable trait. Based on the limited space that we have in our livestock pathway and barn, and the real world educational expectation we have for our students, we should always be striving to produce better, more desirable offspring which in return will cause older animals with less desirable traits to be removed. Regarding auctioning animals instead of selling directly to producers or as pet quality farm animals to the public, due to our small scale operation here at SVS and the inability to keep overstock of cold animals on campus for a single event, logistically, it makes no sense. The expense of putting on an auction would be greater than the money raised. Also in our region of the country, healthy quality animals are usually sold directly to producers. Animals that are not desirable are sold at regional auctions where commissions near 30% on the purchase price and livestock are exposed to disease and parasites. If you had a large herd of exceptionally genetic animals that are extremely desirable, for example, the Yukon beef auction or a large scale cattle ranch, then holding an auction would be a viable option. The students in our program should be learning to set goals to help direct our school into the future and provide better opportunities to the next group of students. Sometimes to achieve these goals, difficult decisions will have to be made along the way to continue advancing towards those goals. These are real life situations they will be faced with in the future, whether they continue in agriculture or follow a different pathway. But ultimately these choices that they will make will prepare them to make other difficult choices in their future. I have an example of one of those hard choices regarding livestock pulling that I'd like to share. My daughter who's 11 years old has been showing goats competitively for four years. She was faced with a tough decision this fall. In order to improve the quality of her show animals, she needs to make room for this year's kids, which will ultimately have better genetics than her older does, meaning some animals will be sold. She made the decision to sell the first goat she ever owned. It was her first showmanship animal and, the first, and brought home her first win with that animal. She came to me without any guidance and said, Buttercup doesn't make the cut and must be sold. It shows tremendous responsibility and a desire to succeed in the show ring. And although the decision was tough, she felt it was right, the right one to move her project forward. 
These are the life lessons we should be teaching our agri-science students and ultimately giving them a say in what happens with their animals and how to spend the proceeds generated by those sales. In conclusion, I hope the board will take into consideration the proposal I'm putting forth. Our agri-science program has a very supportive group of people in the agri-science consulting committee that meets three times a year to help guide this program. We're mandated by the state of Connecticut to offer insight to the department and administration that helps ensure the student's education is in line with the industry to better prepare them for the future. We're always available to help answer any questions that come up that will benefit our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Greg, can you tell me your name and where you're from and a little bit about you? Because uh, So my name's Tim Armbruster. I'm from Roxbury. Okay. Um, I am the currently the manager at Toplands Farm. Okay. And I am the uh, chairman of the Agri-Science Consulting Committee here at Chicago. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's funny, the superintendent and I just had this conversation a couple of days ago where we were discussing this very topic. And uh, one of the things I had asked him to please do is come in with a plan and uh, on, on how to dispose of animals and that we should include um, looking at such issues as the FFA owning the animals. Uh, and in addition to that, um, uh, I asked him to please make sure that he coordinated with your committee to get the best advice on how to do this. So your timing is perfect. And now you've laid it out. So we'll just have to record this and uh, yeah. and we'll be in great shape. It makes sense because it puts it in the hands of the students. It takes it away from you guys and, and it aligns us with what the other programs do. I can speak for uh, Wamogo because I've I communicated with them and stuff like that. So. And the FFA owns the animals at Wamogo. That was my understanding. Thanks. Thanks can, I ask, much. can I ask a question? Yes. Could you find out? Hi, I'm Nicole. I think we've met before. Could you find out from um, another program how they handle um, liability insurance from that perspective? I, think I would it imagine it probably be the same as the least animals that you have because you would probably just be leasing them through, you know, I don't know, I can ask, but I, I would imagine it's no different than somebody else owning an animal that's here that belongs to somebody else at the school of use. So when that happens, we provide insurance to that person. So in this instance, if if you were, I'm just thinking if maybe the timing would be that we would transfer the animal to the FFA immediately before the sale. So that for insurance and liability purposes, it's set on our policy until that would happen. Well, at the other schools, I know they're just owned directly by by the FFA, but I don't know. We can, we can look into it for sure. So do you know if the FFA uses their own tax ID number or if they have their own bank account or if they're linked like they are to us with the student activity? I don't know. I, maybe, maybe we can talk after. So absolutely. Figure those things out. Get you in contact with the people that are up that we want them. That'd be great. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for your input. These are the grisly operational details that have to be gone through to do anything like this. But the but the point is, your idea and what and what should happen is is very meritorious. Well, like I said, really one word, uh, not so much in these meetings, but in our own, is that agri science education is nothing new. You know, nanowag has been over a hundred years. Mogo, I don't know, but it's been longer than I've been around because I've graduated twenty years from there. But, um, you know, we can learn a lot from what other programs do because we're not in competition with them. We, you know, our students don't have an option. This is their option. This is the only place they can go. And so when we can reach out to other schools and get that information, so that way we can not reinvent the wheel and just move forward, you know, more quickly, we have that ability. So. Sounds great. The price list that um, we had recommended do you agree with that or do you think that needs to be amended no i agree with it um so i was consulted a little bit on some of the pricing because of my my job and what i do um one of the biggest things to keep in mind is that for the most part animal pricing is based on the market um, right now beef is in my opinion out of control um but we're paying for it because we have to we have no other choice um, so it, it is, it moves around a little bit, but I think for the quality of the animals that are here, um, most of them are not superior genetics. Um, so you're just looking at market prices for that stuff. Um, but there's a lot of other factors that can be taken into, into consideration with. with the Great. Thank you. John. One question leads to another. Um, Speaking of the quality of the animals, um, 
So, and you're trying to breed a better, better animal. But I'm just wondering, would it be expected that every year we, we try to breed the animals for offspring for sale or I'm, I'm not, what are you anticipating as far as the number of animals that would be for sale every year? Well, I think I think that depends on on what the, the staff of the agri-science department um, decides to do. Um, part of it is the educational value. So it depends on um, if there's the interest in breeding animals um, at that time for for teaching genetics, teaching, um, you know, care during pregnancy, um, kidding, calving, lambing, whatever it may be at the end and uh, and growing those animals. So some years there may be there may be interest in breeding. Um, other years, if you know there's focus elsewhere, it may not be something that that is done. So it's going to be basically based on what um, you know what the agri science department decides to do. But there is going to be a regular turnover of animals. Uh, you know, if you breed sheep or goats, uh, you know you're looking at two to three, possibly four offspring uh, from each animal. And with the facilities that we have here, it's not you're not going to be able to keep many. Um, so, you know, there, there is going to be a turnover and it'll, it'll determine too, based on the quality of the animal, uh, just because it has better genetics, it may not, that baby may not be better than its mom. You know, there's, there's a million different factors that go into, into the genetics, but it's, uh, that's part of the education. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Vicki. Good. Hi. Um. I have a question about how agri science programs do they when somebody let's say says I have two goats or four goats that I'd like to offer to your program, do they do they have specific qualifications or specific things that they're looking for in those animals that are being given to a program? So for example, if let's say we were given a few goats and then you realize during, you know, over the course of the year that they are not up to your qualifications, to your specifications, and then you want to get rid of those goats or cows or whatever. I'm just using goats as an example. Do you have, do you advertise programs have like a list that they look for in animals that are being donated to them or not? So to that, um, a lot of it falls on on the um, on the department determining what they want for their students to learn. I think um, you know in the infancy of this program, I think it was you know we needed to have animals here to learn with, and we have what we have. Um, you know the possibility of of upping our genetic game here um, and having exceptional animals that can be shown uh, to showcase our facility and what we can do. Um, I think that's something that we're going to be working towards. Uh, I definitely, I'm gonna steal a little bit from Wamogo. I've had some conversations with some people and we've, we've had these talks about um, having little committees, subcommittees of the consulting committee that would help meet with um, students and, and teachers to, you know, kind of, vet the animals to look through them see if you know if that's something that we want is it sick is it healthy have maybe the veterinarian involved as well because a, a lot of times uh, the better the animal you get it's obviously going to be more money so the investment of having somebody look at them professionally that's an outside source to make sure that they're healthy and that they don't have long-term health issues now, I think that's something that we're going to be heading in the direction here is, is, you know, being able to vet animals because in the end, yeah, it's about education and it's not about being an animal sanction. We have a limited amount of space. We don't want to bring in stuff that somebody just, you know, wants to donate. Um, you know, it's always nice. Everybody always puts out on Facebook that, oh, I have these animals. Let's see if the school wants them. But, you know, <laughs> We have limited space and we need to have the best quality animals we can have so our students can showcase them. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.
All right, moving on. Um, any other questions? Any other uh, members of the public wish to uh, comment on agenda? Okay, in that case, we will move on to um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. On that agenda are minutes of the Board of Ed meeting of November 6. Is there anyone who wishes to take them off the consent agenda in order to make changes or discuss them? Hearing none, those minutes will be deemed adopted. And now, FFA officers, National Convention, Tyler. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm joined here by Miss Barry and the officer team that could make it tonight. Uh, I figured I would leave most of the updating to them as uh, I wasn't able to attend the trip this year, but Miss Barry coordinated, planned, did all the legwork for this trip as always, and there's a ton of work involved with this trip. Um, she's right alongside the students the entire time. Uh, so I will, I will let them give you guys the update. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so we appreciate your time this evening in allowing us to come talk a little bit about the Students National Convention trip. And I would really like for you to hear from them. So I'm just going to keep this really short and brief that we had record breaking numbers at National Convention this year. We had over 71,000 blue jackets, advisors, and families there this year um, by the end of the week, which is an amazing turnout. When you sit in Lucas Oil Stadium, surrounded from floor to ceiling by blue jackets, it's a really good feeling. So I'm going to introduce Jayla Lantiga. She is our chapter president this year to take it away. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jayla Lantigua. I'm from Danbury, Connecticut. I'm in the animal science program, and I'm this year's president. Hi, my name is Haley Collette. I am from Roxbury. I am also in the animal pathway, and I'm this year's chapter vice president. Hello, I'm Rebecca Wheeler. I'm also from Roxbury. I'm in the mechanics pathway. I'm a junior and I'm this year's secretary. Hello, I'm Cameron Gertner. I am from Washington. I am in the mechanics pathway and I'm a senior and I am the treasurer. Hi, I'm Mina Kiraldin. I'm from New Milford, Connecticut. I'm this year's student advisor. I'm in the food science pathway and I'm a junior. Hi, I'm Emily Grant. I'm from New Milford, Connecticut. I'm this year's historian and I'm in ag mechanics and a junior. Hi, I'm Jack Sampson. I'm a junior this year. I'm from Fairfield. I'm this year's son of all ag Okay, so this is our, this is the 96th annual National FFA Convention. Um, here we have um, all of our officers at the rodeo here. And then here are our jackets in front of the big FFA welcoming um, sign. <laughs> Okay, and, and uh, an overview of our slide show today is going to be just our individual officer slides and then any questions or commentary that you have. So I don't know if we're going to be able to play the video for everyone here tonight, but the video is basically um, all our Connecticut Chicago FFA jackets right next to um, the 50 states. We have each jacket that has a different state on it. And then this is my slide. So just thing, some things that I learned during the national convention trip was learning to evolve as a person, as a leader, as a Chicago um, member, Chicago FFA member, and also just evolving in my agricultural studies as well. Then also I learned the diversity throughout agriculture. I was talking to Puerto Rico and I asked them, what do you guys do for FFA? Because it's a different climate, a different 
just type of environment over there. And they told me that they do um food lines where they like feed people, they feed like homeless people or they feed their communities with their traditional like rice, beans, chicken, like Puerto Rican traditional dishes. And I found that just like very interesting that they get to do like things like that. Then also I just have a quote up there. We do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our energy. And that's by Juan Berendera. I think I'm I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But that was just um the speaker for FFA this year and I really enjoyed that quote. And then also I learned more about expanding my leadership, um, how to be a leader, even though there's not an exact way to be a leader, but I just learned how to, you know, be a leader without like overstepping the boundaries between my officer team, between any team that I'm going to be working with in the future. And then things that I'm bringing to our chapter this year, a positive tradition, positive tradition associated associated with the FFA organization, um, a more a more structured and bonded officer team because we got to bond for a week. <laughs> and then also um, networking between local and national chapters. I got to meet a lot of new chapters, talk to a lot of new bases. And then also the FFA lifestyle. Thank you. This is my slide. Um, um, some things that I learned from the convention was that going to the convention with our other officers was a great way to bond. I feel like now we have more of a bigger connection and we all kind of know each other more, um, as well as the knowledge from other states and other chapters and how they run their chapters. Like Jayla said, we talked to so many different people from so many different places, from Kentucky to Ohio to Maine and Puerto Rico, which was absolutely amazing. And how to prop we also went into different workshops and we one of the workshops that I went to, we learned more about how to build a resume and how to introduce yourself properly and communicate more effectively with others as well. Um, as well as uh if you have a goal and you continue to work on it, you will get there or even further. That's most of what I learned that if you continue to work on a goal and you push forward on it, you can get there and you can get even further into that goal. Thank you. So what I learned was how to interact with a bunch of different people at like all at one time. One of the workshops that we went to was about how to interact with a group and how to properly introduce yourself and build a resume, um, working on how to keep yourself organized and how to keep yourself professional in front of a crowd or in front of a group. Um, and I thought that was really important as we mingled with other people from around the country and Puerto Rico. Um, and it was really great to see a bunch of different people from a, different, a bunch of different places and see how they ran things. Um, I know in Kentucky, they did line dancing at every chapter meeting. Um, so that was really cool to just interact with a bunch of different people from a bunch of different places. And the rodeo was pretty cool too. <laughs> Um, some of my favorite things at convention were the rodeo. It was great to see all the live entertainment and especially see people get thrown off bulls. <laughs> um, another thing that was a lot of fun was the expo there. They have a bunch of things to offer. You can go around, talk to a bunch of different colleges, see it as a lot of different things in an agricultural aspect or even just other careers that you can do. Um, another great thing was spending a lot of time with some amazing people, but also being able to meet new people from all over the country, hear about what they like, what they want to see happen. And 
some things that I learned was one's building a resume. Got to learn great skills on that. Um, and then advocating. And you always want to keep your end goal in mind. And one quote that I learned, heard from Sky Juan Bananda in the opening ceremony at Lucas Oil Stadium was, don't let other people put you down. Do the best you can do. This is great. Um, so I'll be presenting Dan, our reporter, his slides since he couldn't be here tonight. So at Nationals, he learned more about like stepping out of his comfort zone and into situations with people he had never met before. And also he learned how like much our country and FFA members are dedicated to like spreading agricultural knowledge. And his overall experience is that he had a great time and he met a lot of new and old faces and started friendships there. And he also had a great time like forging bonds with like our officer team. My brother came back with breathing. His first sense of community. We talked about community in our chat rooms, how we want to work together, but you can really see it when you go to nationals. Like Ms. Barry said, there's 71,000 people. You meet people from all over. You really get to talk and have conversations with people. Second, skills. We did workshops. Um, we learned how to build the resume, how to really introduce ourselves to people, and how to sell things. And we're going to advocate. Second, um, have an end goal in mind. Uh, know what you want to end. And finally, memories. We spent a week together. We did a lot of fun things. One of my favorite memories is the rodeo. We just fun to watch. And yeah, we was fun to watch. And um, in the expo, I found a camp that will teach you dog riding. So I'm going to go explore that with some. Um, so I'll be presenting for Mackenzie. She couldn't be here tonight. Um, but some things that she took away from this was spending, <laughs> although spending a long period of time with our officer team and our peers, it makes our bond grow, as well as learning true responsibility and education throughout the week, and learning about ways that different states embrace their experiences in their FFA chapters, um, since we're not all the same, obviously, so. Um, so throughout the week at FFA National Convention, I took away, <laughs> I took away from our trip that FFA is actually, it's one big family through <laughs> all 71,000 people that were there. Um, everyone's kind of welcoming when you're just walking through the expo or at the rodeo, um, you know, opening ceremonies, everything like that. Um, we actually, we came back and we wouldn't trade it, you know, for anything, what we have now, um as our officer team and everything. So yeah, we we realized that through our blue jackets is where it all starts for us. Um, we're obviously gonna go on through into college and then, you know, out into the real world, but this is where it starts for us. So thank you. So like what some things I learned at National Convention was like how to prepare myself for the future through like resumes and learning advocacy for ourselves. And also I learned how agriculture and FFA is embraced in like different schools around the country, since like different states have different like kind of traditions and stuff that they, they'll do compared to here in Connecticut. And I think some things that we got out of it as a team was that our whole like officer team was able to bond with one another pretty well. And we also met many friendly people from different chapters around the country. So on behalf, sorry. So on behalf of our POG FFA officer team, we just want to say thank you so much for letting us go and approving this trip, as well as our alumni for supporting the trip as well. And any questions or concerns? Sorry, questions or comments, please let us know. Ask us. John? I have one for Mina. Can you describe your role and um, uh, what do you, what 
as an advisor, what is your what are your duties? Part of my duties is really like helping with the very first thing like that, and then also like interacting with the community and stuff like that. We can talk about the office. So is, does it have to do with helping students to decide what, what their pathways are? Not necessarily. Or like just kind of earlier in the year. So like I thought later in the year we'll help out and target that stuff. And like I know we're definitely planning on talking to students more about like different activities that are open to like joining and just different activities that you can do with them. Okay. Okay. Other questions? I hate to hog your question. Oh, go ahead, John. Do you find it difficult to fulfill your SAE hours as a group? Or whoever you can. I work up at Eagle Farm in Washington. So, like during the fall, I was working up there, like at the farm stand, and we were doing customers. And so I was able to get my hours pretty easily through that. Um, with my SAE, I work at Ox Hollow Farm for Mark Maynard. Um, getting in my hours for me is really not that hard because I'm there all summer, all day. I love it. It's the farm is practically on the farm at this point because Mark relies on me a lot. And I, to me, getting the hours isn't just being there for hours. It's being there to help the farm, help Mark with whatever he needs go to markets, go to the stand, and just be in the community and be able to work with my hands. I'd rather be working in the dirt, being dirty, instead of sitting at a desk on a computer all day. So to me, getting my hours is quite easy. Okay, so my SAE, I had two parts of it. So my summer SAE was... I went to the Dominican Republic on my grandfather's farm and researched about how um, meat production farms operate in the Dominican Republic through firsthand experience through my grandfather. And then my second part is throughout the school year, I work at Aspatec Animal Hospital and I'm working to be certified as a veterinary assistant. And I get all my hours through on online through the ACT training, as well as I work hands-on with animals that are not so happy to see me on a daily basis but I still love my job I just came from there and I, I love my job I love all the dogs and all the people that I work with thank you so for my essay I show my 11 dairy cattle um, I also have a giant garden that I do and I make maple syrup so <laughs> I got three going at the moment so fulfilling my hours is pretty easy I'm on the farm every day pretty much all day except for school um, so the hours are pretty easy to get and they're fun to do it's doing what I love thank you for my essay I work at Salton Farm in Milford do everything from growing vegetables hanging the fields doing woodworking um, mechanics um, bringing food to the food bank, growing it for the different local markets. Um, and part of that is a lot of like forestry work, which ties into my senior project. Um, so, and maple syrup thing. And I'd say it's pretty easy for me to get my hours. Um, love doing the work, love being outside, working with my hands and just growing myself as a person and being better able to help the community and make it a better place for the future. work at uh, Crossroads Rushman Center in Bruce, New York. Um, I work there two days a week during the school year, plus whenever I just want to go out to school. And then I work four days a week during the summer. I'm working seven hours a day at least. Um, so I find it really easy to get my hours in, but it's not just the hours, it's the experience, it's the learning. Every day I learn something new, something that's going to be helpful, even here as I go back to the Um, so I show my dairy cattle as well from Rebecca. Um, and I don't really find it too hard to to get our hours in even through the school year because 
<laughs> animals, they, they got to be fed. You know what I mean? So that's kind of part of my SAE anyways. So we get into breeding and AIing and everything like that, um, you know, all of my cows. So it's really, and especially through the summer when fair season starts and shows and everything, it's more than enough hours. And I think that our school is pretty lenient with the hours and, you know, getting everything done in a certain time frame. So I find it, you know, pretty easy to do. Okay. Okay. I just have a, I just wanted to comment. I'm just so blown away by all of your experiences and sharing them with us tonight. And I just, it restores my faith in humanity when I hear all of you speak truly because I just, I can feel the energy that you really love what you're doing. And I'm really excited for all of you. So thank you so much for coming and sharing uh, with all of us, because it really gives us insight to not just the program, but what you're doing with it personally. And that really helps um, to, feel, to feel like I'm a little bit a part of your world for even just a few minutes. So thank you so much. And on a sidebar, just a, not tonight, but Tyler, I'd love you to come back to talk a little bit more about the discussion earlier during public comment with the like director, I would really like to hear from you. Absolutely. And uh, Jen, you guys are certainly a part of our world, and we thank you guys all for your support this year and last. Um, I will definitely be back, and I'd like to share a winter update with you guys anyway. Um, our open house was wildly successful two weeks ago. Like, blew my mind how many families came that evening. So, uh, over 140. It actually signed in, so not to get sidetracked, but um, but one of the questions we also got last year was uh, if we intended on planning, uh, uh, intended on bringing more kids. And Megan, I, I, I just want to recognize her again because she does so much work behind the scenes for all of this stuff, um, planning and calling hotels and, and just it's it's really, really commendable the work that she does and how organized she is. But one of her suggestions for next year was how can we get more kids? So. Uh, we do have a plan that is still kind of going through the, the process right now, but our plan is to bring at least double the, the crowd next year. So I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that because I know that was something that was asked last year. So thank you guys again. Uh, Pete, did you have a question? I guess not. Uh, Vicki. Um, I'm so proud of for possibly going out of your comfort zone to come here tonight and think about. Um, and I think that's great. That's how I personally have a question. Other questions? Yes, Mary. I just wanted to tell you, thank you very much. You represent us so well, and you speak so well. And Megan, Tyler, did the best. I'm so glad you're all here. Thank you very much. Other questions? Well, I was going to say that the next item on the agenda is the chairman's report, and I'd like you to stay where you are so I can make this report, because it's all about your your uh, what you just described to us, this this wonderful open house that you had. I mean, you you, you really want to double it for next year. Well, I think you've doubled it since last year uh, because this was an enormous crowd. There were over 300 people in the building to see this, obviously 140 families, but there were a lot more people than just one per family. And it was a terrific, terrific night. Uh, a few parents had come up to me and asked me if, you know, some questions. And I said, D don't look at me. Just look for someone in a blue coat. These are our experts. And that's where you should go to get all your questions answered. And I talked to almost every one of you uh, while we were there. And once again, I was, I was, I was always impressed with your, you know, with, with the way you conduct yourselves, uh, with your maturity, with uh, just the, the way you know your area that you're interested in. Uh, and, and the way you, I've got to tell you, the thing that I really appreciate is it's so wonderful that all of you uh, have come here and have taken such an enormous role in making this a it, it better and better and better program every year. And it's a, due a lot to your effort. Uh, and, and that really makes a big difference. I mean, we have, you know, we, you know, we have tremendous faculty. We've got Mr. Premins, but we've got you. 
and you are the best and you are making our program into a stellar program. I can't thank you enough. And by the way, if you need to know anything about horses, you need to seek Jack because I saw him just deal with everything that had to go over that in that Equan part. He doesn't remember. <laughs> I mean, if anyone needed to know something, he was right there to answer. So it was really a wonderful experience. I, I, I urge you all to take a shot one year and come see this open house. And you're going to see us really performing at a high level. And you're going to see all the people who are interested in coming here. Uh, and I, I, I think it's going to be a successful program because of your efforts. Thank you very much. And uh, the agri-science teachers did a lot of work leading up to that event. And they ran the show. But I the, my favorite memory from that evening was there was a family, uh, a man and his uh, two twin boys came and uh, we talked uh, at the beginning a little bit. He's like, only he's going to apply and my other boy, he's he's not interested. And so I was like, okay, well, enjoy the facility, enjoy the tour. You know, I'll talk to you guys when you leave. And then when they left, the dad was like, hey, they're both applying. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the kind of evening that it was. Uh, it was just a home run. So. Well, I'll also add to that that I spoke to a family with one of them. They had two children. One was an eighth grader and one was, I think, a fourth or fifth grader. And the fourth or fifth grader can't wait till he's eligible to apply. They're, you'll have both. You'll get both of them, too. So there you go. Great. Thank you all so very much. Thanks. Well, those are some impressive kids. You have had my report, so that's it. We'll move on out of the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. Uh, my face still hurts from smiling so much, watching those kids talk and, and share their stories. Um, they really are remarkable kids. It's a remarkable program. Uh, the turnout was massive for the Ag Open House. Um, I was blown away. I had a wonderful conversation with the family, so, you know, we're Begging and pleading and doing everything they could possibly get the kids to the front of the line. So uh, the demand is huge for next year. Um, so that just testing all of those folks. Um, the other thing that, as I talk about my report, I'll be talking about a lot of fun things that have happened and um, important things that have happened in the school since we last met. But one thing that's probably not going to be immediately apparent is that our ag students play such a role in all those things, right? So tonight I'll be talking about the play. There were ag students involved in drama. There were ag students who built the sets. And um, the director of the play, <clears throat> Robin Frome, told me that the ag kids are actually the best. He said, these kids work morning to night. They have an incredible work ethic. They're highly skilled. Um, and they were just a, a wonderful team to work with. So um, they, they show up in ways you don't expect, right? So who would have thought, you know, that the ag kids would, you know, help contribute to the drama program? I certainly wouldn't have. Um, we had ag kids on virtually all of our teams that went to championships and competed. Again, um, these are value adds that extend far beyond what kids typically think when uh, people typically think when they think about ag kids. Um, and so um, these are students who, again, have risen to be in the top five in, in their class um, and members of our National Honor Society. And uh, the kids are just a great part of our school. So, um, you know, we're really proud of them and, and all that they bring. Um, I had the chance, as I said, to attend the uh, Saturday evening performance of the Canterville Ghost. And I just want to say bravo to the students and to Mr. Frome. It was a spectacular production. What really stood out to me was that this play worked. Uh, it was so important because the, the ownership that the kids had. And that's not usually um, something that you see in a production. Yes, the kids you know, act. And yes, the kids work on the sets. But um, we even had a student who worked as a student director for this play, Kim O'Keefe. And she did um, an amazing job with that and put in a lot of hours. All of these kids were here super late. I would come in and see them still here at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night working on the play. So um, just a big cheer and shout out to them. Uh, it was a great play. Uh, I know that me, my wife, my kids really enjoyed it. You know, magical evening for everyone in the audience. I want to offer a special um, congratulations and celebration for our boys' soccer team. They reached the state final game uh, yesterday. Our Spartans showed tremendous grit and determination as they put in a tremendous performance against an old Saybrook team that I believe captured their fifth straight title. So um, we had no easy feat, but um, our boys showed up and they played really hard. Um, what was amazing is the game was played on the same pitch, that's what they call a field in soccer, the same pitch that the Hartford Athletic Professional team plays on 
um, over at Trinity Health Stadium in Hartford. So it was a memorable experience. Um, you know, that would be similar to being able to go and play uh, at Foxborough Stadium or in Fenway Park or Yankee Stadium. It was just a really spectacular um, experience with it for the students. And then um, we had a huge turnout. I would say that we definitely had um, the audience support and uh, it sounded, at least it sounded like we had a lot more uh, fans than Old Saybrook. I don't know if that was true, but certainly felt that way. So um, Chapag Nation definitely showed out and traveled well. Um, and it was just a, a great day. Fortunately, it didn't go the way that we wanted, but I think the celebration is really in order for all of the work they put in. It was an outstanding season and um, we're really proud of it. Uh, I also want to mention that our undefeated football team will play on their Thanksgiving game um, against Abbott Tech at Immaculate High School in Danbury uh, with a kickoff of 10 o'clock a.m. So um, please come out and share them on. Uh, they're also <clears throat> on tap for another great season. Uh, I want to give an update on <clears throat> community conversations that we had. We're calling this series Primary Priorities. And um, this past week, we had a great turnout in Bridgewater for our latest presentation. The crowd... I was very energized, asked great questions, shared lots of opinions about the issues that we presented. Uh, I want to share that we've added a tab to our website devoted to the community conversations about our elementary schools. And um, we've hosted presentations and uh, supplementary materials on that website. I even created a digital suggestion box to get your feedback. So um, if you want to give us feedback, drop us a note on that um, suggestion box. So click the link. Uh, it's completely confidential. We'd love to hear from you. So be sure to check that out. In preparation for our next topic in the series, which is school safety, um, I'm already in discussions with Newtown's Director of Security, Mike Papon, uh, Mark Papano, sorry, um, to offer a session that focuses on best practices in school safety. And um, we'll be working with him and actually some architects who work in the space uh, about best practices in school safety. So um, that's going to be an exciting uh, next round of topics that will be kicking off in January. Last week, we had the um, opportunity to induct 21 students into our National Honor Society here at Chapag. And um, I've got to say that NHS is probably one of my favorite events of the year because uh, I think it really celebrates what we do best in schools, um, with best about schools. So National Honor Society me members are selected based on their scholarship, service, character, and leadership. Uh, they have to apply. They're evaluated by uh, a committee that puts a lot of scrutiny into this process. And um, and while I believe that those four pillars are all important for well-rounded students, I really wanted to take that opportunity that night to lean in and um, emphasize how important scholarship is. And I think that this is a time sometimes where folks are quick to de-emphasize the importance of academic performance. We hear things like, oh, grades don't really matter. You know, college, you don't have to go to college, it'll be okay. Um, and that may be true, right? But we also know, according to the research, that very little will be more impactful in predicting one's future success and a solid academic preparation. And so I think that NHS induction is a chance to unabashedly praise students for their hard work and their commitment to their studies. And we were all immensely impressed and proud of our students. Today was a really cool day. I got to go to um, a senior luncheon. I saw some folks there. So Jen, uh, Stephanie was helping serving food. Um, but the luncheon that they put on every year for senior citizens of the community um, over at Washington Primary, they put on Thanksgiving feast. The food was tremendous. Um, we had students and volunteers from the PTO that served the crowd. Um, it was an absolutely packed cafeteria. We had a huge crowd. Jen, do you know how many people we had? All right, so. So it was def definitely a great crowd. Um, and 55, and a great chance to, to meet and talk with folks and, um, and hear their stories and it was just a marvelous uh, afternoon today over at Washington. Um, and I just want to thank local businesses such as GW's, the PO, the Washington Market, not uh, missing any. The pantry of Washington Pizza. Yeah, for providing food and desserts um, and beverages. And um, to our WPS students who provided um, performances during the the dinner and they also gave artwork um they made placemats which were adorable um and i just want to thank everybody who made the event a success it was a really uh special day for me so a lot of fun and then tomorrow i think that have even more fun this is actually probably one of the best weeks of my job um you go from one funding to the next so tomorrow i get to be the judge for a spelling bee over at free school and um i love the chance to be involved in these school events um they bring me a lot of joy 
I recently had the chance to do uh, plank challenges during assemblies of the three elementary schools. So I'm sure that tomorrow will be just as fun, but I'm sure it won't take as much core strength. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. I uh, get a chance to relax and have fun. Um, and I just want to close by wishing a happy Thanksgiving to all the students, family, staff, school board, and all the members of our Region 12 community. Um, and I hope that you all have a chance to spend some time with loved ones during the break. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Questions? All right, we'll go for the treasurer. Well, uh, I, I woke up this morning realizing I had nothing to report. So I immediately uh, pulled a rabbit out of my hat and I called Nicole. I, <laughs> I say, okay, what do I need to report? And there are two things that I'd like to report. One is we're in process of uh, negotiating with Sherman about uh, uh, their contract with us for next year and whether they may consider sending just all their kids here. Um, so that is in the offing. And as a surprise note, uh, Chapaw got approved for the solar project. So uh, we're going to have solar here. And that is my report and will be my F and F and O report too. So we just had a meeting um, earlier tonight and Dr. DeFrito uh, walked us through the curriculum update that um, was planned for, for today actually. <laughs> Um, so if you look on the Region 12 website, there's um, a curriculum tab that has everything. So basically uh, just about all the curriculum that the staff uses to, to teach our kids is now available online. Um, as a teacher myself, I, I've written a lot of curriculum and I know that's um, it's a lot of work and, and you know we appreciate all of that work. Um, one of the things that we did talk about was making making it so that parents and community members um, are able to not just access the information, but understand what they are looking at. Um, so that's something that we will continue um, moving forward, trying to figure out ways to get more community involvement. Yeah. Joe's not here, so we'll pass on in advance. Uh, and Alex, you've given us F and O. Policy committee, I can tell you the policy committee met and we have um, reviewed and are presenting this evening 11 policies. Most of them don't have significant changes, but nonetheless, there are a couple. There's one of them, one of the 11 is new. So uh, this is something that we'll, we'll talk about tonight in the, uh, in the um, portion of the uh, agenda related to action. Uh, strategic long range planning, again, Nothing to report. December 12th. December 12th. Okay. We have nothing under old business. We move on to action items. The first item is to consider it if appropriate to approve the 2024-2025 school calendar. We did. It, it may have been added late to the package, or, but I, 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 when I went into the package to print my things, I found it. Yeah, it was added late um, because we put out a survey, to get some feedback from teachers. We had some folks ask us, um, and the requests are kind of coming in and drips and drabs, so we wanted to reach out and really hear from everybody. Uh, we had some folks who were asking, would it be possible to move the professional development day to the day after Halloween? Uh, it tends to be kind of a wash educationally in a lot of spaces and high absenteeism. Um, so we thought on that a little bit and said, there's nothing fundamentally uh, that I was opposed to. I asked our, our principals and admin team. Um, they said, sounds like a good idea to us, but um, we wanted to make sure all the voices in the conversation. So we did a survey with our teachers and the overwhelming um, results of the survey said the teachers favored making that day the PD day. So we wanted to just have an ad until Sunday to complete that. So we wanted to make sure we had all the feedback before we made that final decision. So that was the reason why the packet this morning, um, but that's the, the major change from our first draft. All right, so that the first day of school will be the Tuesday, the 27th of August, uh, with three PD days the week before that. 
Um, and uh, the last day of school will be June 12th. Thursday, June 12th is programmed to be the last day of school, obviously, depending on uh, weather. And the April vacation is the 14th through the 17th, and then the 18th is uh, state holiday, Good Friday. And we work to coordinate that, that spring break um, with surrounding districts. Um, I've told all of these, the superintendents from um, our county and then also from my Western group as well. Um, and by and large, everybody was gonna get together and use the same week. So I think that's helpful for us um, in terms of students who go to other schools, but also staff who uh, live in other communities as well. So um, that date kind of makes the most sense for us to use that. There's only a few outliers that are doing it the week after. Okay. Yes, Angela. So uh, I've gotten this question before and uh, haven't gotten it again because nobody has seen the calendar in the public. Uh, I know that you use, because of Halloween to Friday, I always get from parents, why are we having maybe half days for professional development for get off on the territory to be a Friday to so be so that would be uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19. So that's an interesting um, epic comment. And when we, we've heard that too uh, from time to time. Where it becomes difficult is that um, from a pragmatic standpoint, when we make some of those moves, um, that also is enticing to our faculty and staff to also um, take sick days or, or other days, um, personal days in that time. And so we end up losing a lot of uh, folks that also say, hey, I'll take a long week and that makes a lot of sense for our family too. Um, and so then we bring in um, trainers or, or people to work with our staff um, and we have light attendance. So that's something that we try to take into account as we look at that. Um, you know, and so it's tough. We're trying to, to do what's best for families, but we also have to do what's best for making sure that that day is a, a true learning day for our staff as well. So that's been the, the major reason why we've continued to go with that direction. But um, again, we can certainly revisit it. And then um, November election day, they have that off this year. They don't get it off next year. No, and they didn't have it off. The students had it off, right? right. But, our, but our faculty and staff had a PD day. That's the day that we actually moved to the first. Um, this year was kind of wonky because the day fell um, middle of the week and then that, that day was off and then we had another day right off for um, Veterans Day. And so um, that wasn't something people really loved. Um, so that was one of the reasons I think why the request came initially. But also we don't use our schools as polling places. So oh, okay. uh, it didn't make a lot of sense. And that, that's exactly why we put that question to the faculty and staff and said, because uh, I also know that we have people that live in other communities. And so I was trying to, to weigh that and say, where do most people fall on this issue? And again, the overwhelming majority said, um, We'll figure out childcare on on election day, but um, we'd rather have PD on on the first. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't know that we didn't need the that some towns don't use the school. I thought some towns did. Okay. Other questions about the calendar? Is there a motion to approve the? Oh, by the by the way, you'll note on here that it also says that the expected date of graduation will be June 14, twenty twenty five. That we can't approve that legally until uh, October of 2024. So that, that's that's tentative at this point. And if anyone says, oh, we're planning on that as graduation day, not yet. In October, we'll know. Next October. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the calendar? There's a second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Anyone abstaining? It's 11 to nothing and unanimous. The calendar is approved. Okay, new business. We have uh, a further further information from Dr. DeBrito on test scores. Good evening, A lot everyone. of colorful exhibits. Well, I tried my best to enlarge it and still keep it on one page and to help sort of follow, because I, I believe this is what you were hoping for um, from cohort to cohort with the color coordination. 
And so the top chart is for English language arts. And that's grades three through eight by school. The other one was sort of shrunk. So I did create a larger one, the long legal size um, page is what we're looking at. And then the middle chart is for math, again, grades three through eight, taking all the same smarter balanced assessment. And then science is the last chart, which is assessed in grades five, eight, and 11. And you'll see when we did not have a testing year, there's no data for that specific school year but the different colors do follow the cohort of students. Yeah. Oh. We got a question. Um, COVID. Yeah. Do you think that these numbers, the percentage, what what are these percentages? Are they based on a uh, uh, a straight line, or is it uh, a percentile, or how the is percentages it? Percentages are for that particular group of students in that grade the percent of students that actually met the benchmark. So if we look at 2018, the first cell, top left under English language arts, booth free, it's a very light blue shade, 80% of the third graders in 2018 at booth free met that benchmark. And, and they, that benchmark stays fixed. Yes. Oh, yes. So there are scale, raw, um, data points that are consistent for students in grades three through eight and where they meet within that band determines which level they are at. Now, I haven't got a chance to look at this yet, but did you notice uh, just in general numbers falling off because of COVID? A absolutely. We, we did take a deep dive into math in particular um, which I will we'll talk about after we look at the SAT information. Um, but for some groups of students, it does seem that it was more impactful. So we're still navigating that and coming out of the consequences from the lockdown plus the entire school year after 2020 to 21, where they were six feet apart, not able to talk to anybody, masked for the entire school year after a third of the year of lockdown, and then came back to school still masked 21, 22, three feet apart, minimal interaction. So we're navigating through that. We, um, do see certain grades had more difficulty because as they get older, there's much more material to absorb. And if you were not able to attend or you were at home and virtually attending, there's a disconnect in the learning. And so then there's more of a, a loss and then it's exacerbated year after year. Um, I, I was listening to a report yesterday on the news talking about New York City schools, and they felt that the COVID situation there had set them back maybe a decade. It's many years. They're not the only ones. There are other districts that are increasing the school day, increasing the school year, trying to make up for the lost time. Thank you. Yes. Hey, I'm not quite sure that that tells the entire story here. Because I'm looking at, uh, for example, you're looking at Burnham and math, and, and the third grade in 2022 scored 100%. And then that same cohort the next year dropped off to 58%. And that's something that I see throughout these numbers. 
Uh, I mean, some stay consistent from some cohorts stay consistent from year to year. Uh, that particular cohort in in uh, ELA um, went from 82 to 83 percent, but in math it was it was a big fall off. Uh, and then when you look at where some of these things like ELA end up in the middle in the middle high school, uh, the class of third grade 2018 at Booth, um, 80 to 90 80 percent, then then went up to 93 percent in 2019. And you look at the other cohorts and where they've gone in various years. And then you look at when they get to middle high school and that class that was 80 and 93 at Booth and it was 100 at Burnham and it was 48 and 84 at Washington Primary then merged into a class with 67, 67 and 69. So I'm looking at these numbers and I'm saying that there's it's more than COVID because, yes, the early numbers went down. That would that may have been a COVID effect one, but the others don't. And I, I don't, I can't make sense of this. Keep in mind, Burnham School went through a big change as well. And we've had some um, staffing, staffing situations there also recently. So we're looking at all of the information. Well, I, I just, I didn't, I mean, I'm not trying to pick out Burnham. I'm just simply saying that that was a stark number to go from a cohort to go from 100% to 58%. It's a pretty big drop. And, and that was 2022 and 23 after COVID. That was post-COVID. So you can't blame COVID on that. Well, the cohort from one school gets merged with all of them from the other schools. And so the third graders in 2018, you will see later on um, in sixth grade in 2021. Right, I get that, but um, but the numbers are are not impressive. Well, they do. They're can they're consistently down. Uh, I mean, the numbers in middle high school are consistently lower than the numbers in elementary school. Not completely. Some of the elementary school numbers are not exactly overwhelming either, but the but the ones in middle high school seem to be much lower. In, in most respects, certainly in math. Uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers in at Booth, Burnham, and Primary, the Washington Primary, you, you see generally numbers in the in the 80s, 90s, 100s. You see a lot of those, both pre and post COVID. And then you look at the at the numbers for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, as those cohorts arrive, and you see numbers in the 50s and 60s. Well, I, I don't know what this is, but. What, I mean, normally when we look at these tests, these standardized tests, we're we're looking at them, trying not trying so much to see how how bright or the kids are. I mean, this is a question of whether or not our curriculum is aligned to the, you know, whether we're teaching the things that this test is looking for. Yeah. Now, maybe we don't want to teach the test, but it would be nice to know that. Or are we trying to teach to the test and we're not succeeding? But it, it, to to see these scores is it's, it's just disappointing. I mean, so what, we're going to go into. We we're going to go into more detail on the back of the other sheet that's not color coded is where you have the SAT. So if you flip over the charts that are not color coded, then you will see the SAT. Yeah. And you have a data there from 2019, 2022, and 2023. And in 2022 was when John, you brought up how Megan had shared a big concern in 2022, still a concern in 2023, um, although the percentage is higher there. Um, but we did have a meeting with the entire math department, six through 12, and Don and Mike and Mark and myself, just to get everyone in the same room to really just talk to each other so that the teacher's voice is heard. And it's not about shaming. It's not about blaming at all. Um, it's always about coming together and working together um, to help meet student needs. And there is a chart in front of you, um, Mathematics Review 6 through 12, that give some explanation, some concerns that were shared by teachers.
Well, let, let, let me ask you a question. Uh, I mean, you're throwing a lot of test information at us. And when you, you have this chart here that is the college board, the SAT results. Right. Um, is our curriculum designed to be aligned with the SAT? Our curriculum is designed to be aligned with the state standards. The college board assessment is designed as a college placement exam, not designed by the state as far as assessments. Then why are we? Then why is the state of Connecticut using this as a as a as a measure of testing? If it doesn't, if it's not aligned with what they want us to teach. Because it became very political a few years ago, and students were um, refusing to take the 11th grade state assessment at the time. And so it seemed to be an effort to appease um, families that were complaining that students had to take the AP testing. They also had to do the SAT. They also had to do the next generation science standards and the Smarter Balanced 11th grade test. So the state took the opportunity to partner um, and pay College Board to assess all of the 11th graders, regardless of whether they're going to college or not. Well, is this just another another great state of Connecticut profile and courage, or is this is this an attempt, deliberate attempt to be cruel? I mean, the idea of saying we're not going to teach what's on this test, but we're going to give you this test, and we're going to judge our teachers and 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 the students by it. it it's it, it's nonsensical. Uh, it's absolutely a catch twenty two. I mean, it, it, it would it would have Joseph Heller spinning on his, on, you know on a circle on his head. I mean, to do that makes no sense whatsoever. It, is it the state? Is it just an attempt to be cruel, or does the state simply are, are they so cowardly that they've they 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 caved into this and done something which is cruel, which is they're not using the right metrics to evaluate the performance because that's not what we're teaching. I mean, why even have the test? I mean, what's the point? How does it help us? How does it help us align our curriculum? I am just absolutely apoplectic about this concept of we don't teach this, but we're testing you. They talk about, I mean, maybe that was the, maybe that was their response. You don't want to take the test? Good, then we'll give you a test that has nothing to do with what you know. I mean, really, I mean, this is crazy. Well, we don't make the rules, but we still got to play the game, right? No, I understand that, but it's crazy. And someone needs to call them out and say it's crazy. Or that they need to come here and educate us that, no, Mr. Kava, you're wrong. It's not crazy. There's a reason for this. And here's the reason. But I'm not understanding it because my understanding is we use tests to measure whether our curriculum is aligned properly, whether we are teaching that the test is what we want the kids to know. And if we're teaching it properly, or if we're teaching it effectively, then they should be performing well. That's one one way to use assessment for sure, right? I think the idea behind the SAT was to set a lofty goal and that kids would rise to meet it and it would force districts to um, increase their rigor and get kids ready for college um, and not sit on their laurels. And, and that was the, the, the gambit, whether it worked or not. I think we, we can argue about that. But we can't argue with the fact that others, every other district in the state has to play by the same rules. And there are others who are doing it better than we are. So if it's a, you know, question about whether it's, you know, fair or not, aligned or not, um, those are interesting. But I think at the same time, we have to also say, what can we do within our locus of control um, to give our kids the best chance to, to be successful on this test? Um, and I think that one of the things that we see, and you can look at it across all these charts, the common denominator to me is that our middle school preparation for students is weak. And that's where um, we start having an issue where it's tough to continue, especially in something like math, to build upon previous learning if you're not getting a solid foundation. And so um, the other part of this, especially with math on the SAT, is that most of this test, um, the vast majority of it, is comprised of algebra. And so we need to do a really good job teaching algebra not just teach it, but make it stick, right? So it's, you've got to keep going out there and practicing, flexing those algebra muscles time and again. And so if that takes a daily, you know, algebra, you know, warm up exercise, we got to do something to make sure that we're making algebra something that's sticky. Because if you're taking it early on in the sequence and now you're not being tested on until 11th grade, we need to make sure that kids still have that fresh or have those skills. Um, and 
algebra is a good indicator of future math success. That's what calculus is built on. That's what um, all of our high level maths are built on. Uh, I would say that we want to spend more money and time and effort on that than on something like geometry, which is kind of a mathematical one off, so to speak. But I think algebra is where we really need to spend a lot of time and attention. Um, I've made no bones about that in talking to um, the admin at the, at the high school and also um, with the math department chair and with uh, Dr. DeBrito, that I really think that algebra is our uh, Achilles heel here. We need to get serious about doing a better job teaching algebra. And it's for all those reasons why we came together. And we really asked, what do you notice that's different? What do you notice that potentially might help that we have control over? And they shared a lot. They shared a lot of information. They shared some challenges with the reduction in class time. For the recent few years, middle school students do not have math every day. A teacher mapped out exactly how many hours a week just this school year students were having math. And it ranged from just over two and a half hours a week to maybe a little over three hours a week where they're getting it consistently every single day. So they're asking for a schedule where math is instructed every single day, especially for our middle level students. Um, they also talked about a disconnect with students retaining the information. And I put an article in your packet as well, because there's a lot of recent research about students not utilizing memory because they're so quick to look up information that they don't actually think about it and hold on to it. Um, they also talked about ways that at the building level, we could elevate the importance of these assessments um, and certainly maybe have pep rallies, reward systems, ways for students to get messaging from everybody, including um, the administration to make sure that everyone knows how important these assessments are. They also talked about um, the change in the demographics and that half of the students come with very, or very, I should say, a variety of availability to understanding math. So they do not come into ninth grade with the same knowledge. And when half of the class has a variety of experiences and struggle accessing the learning, that's creating a strain on everybody. So we're looking at how we can be creative with the amount of time we have to maximize, to accelerate when it's a lot of kids we don't know. So there's a whole list here of concerns. They are real. These are not made up. And so we decided to just really start talking about what can administration do? What can teachers do? How do we pull in parents? How do we build more partnerships with families? Because as kids get older, it drops off. So, and I did do the survey that you recommended on student perspective of importance of the SAT. And you got like all their quotes. So I wanted you to get a whole perspective because no one is shying away from this. We are leaning into this and working with the challenges in front of us and the challenges are real. And yes, we're gonna look at program and yes, we're looking at what additional resources we can offer and whether Institute for Learning is the right professional learning at this time. Justin, I know you had your hand up. Could, could you talk more about the uh, Institute for Learning? I see here that some of the concerns are that I'm assuming ROI is return on investment. Investment, that is correct. So, so what, I don't sure. know, tell us about that. So three years ago when Megan um, brought in Institute for Learning is because she had experience with them when she was in Hartford. And their focus was to increase student dialogue in the classroom because it was very apparent after COVID that they retreated from learning. They were not engaging. And of course we had trained them to stay quiet for so long. But the question is the productive struggle, the accountable talk moves, 
that they are sharing with teachers, is that the best way for us to use our funding? Are there other ways that we should provide professional learning based on teacher input and based on what we're seeing in the classroom? Other questions, then Angela. So I've got a lot going through my mind right now. I am a parent, I'm a taxpayer, and there is so many, we have so many people coming from so many different areas. And I'm gonna give you an example, and my son will likely not speak to me for quite some time for doing this, but it's very important that we look at this. My son came from Danbury in sixth grade. And in Danbury, he was at a high level of math. When he came here, within hours of the first day, within minutes actually in his math class, the building math tutor was called in because he was not at the same level as the children that came from our three elementary schools. This was embarrassing to him. And it was very difficult for him to swallow. But our team of teachers pounced right on it and got him to where he needed to be, which is admirable but he's still not where he should be and he's in 10th grade. That is quite a bit of time. Now, I'd like to know what we are doing after we see these scores from the PSATs from our 10th graders or our 9th graders, whoever, you know, whoever takes it. What are we doing to say, okay, they're taking the PSATs again in March. Am I correct? Then we have next year, they are taking these SATs. Mm -hmm. if, some chill, if some of our students feel they did not do as well as their peers and they're internalizing this, which they are, what are we doing as a district to help our students feel better about themselves, feel that they are in a good place to take these PSATs and SATs. And how are we going to ensure that they are going to be the best that they can possibly be? Are we going to offer extra school classes? Or are we going to send home packages that they can work on at home with their families? Are we going to offer Saturday help? What are we doing to get these scores up? So we did in the past offer an SAT course that was not during any other instructional time or like advisories or like a, a time when students are not in class and the teachers are seeking to bring that opportunity back and then connect with the students. At that time, families were involved, students knew why they were there, and it was very, very specific towards the students' results and helping them prepare for the SAT. So that is on the table. Another is a position to hire certified math interventionist to assist. Now your son was in sixth grade. We're talking about students who are coming in ninth grade. Right. And this with is many more years of not being here. Correct. So we are accepting students from all different districts. And it shouldn't be this way, but it is this way that they are being taught differently in those districts. So we have a variety of learning levels coming in. How is that affecting our numbers? And how are we screening 
these students coming in. So for example, we have students coming in in ninth grade who are part of, let's say, the ag program. And they come from Danbury, they come from Sherman, they come from New Fairfield, wherever they're coming from, they're all coming in at different levels. And are we screening them? Are we offering tutoring to the ones that aren't up at, to the same level as our students that have come from our three elementary schools, if that is the case? I mean, how is this hurt? Is this hurting our numbers? And are we being proactive enough to help our students? So we have found that the profile, meaning what's on paper, doesn't align to what we would expect, right? So there's a disconnect there. Even though the standards are the same standards, supposedly we're expecting them to come into ninth grade having mastered the standards are expected through eighth. We are talking about how we could potentially do a screener before they arrive. How could we potentially do a boot camp, do something to connect with the students before they come here? That's all still in the brainstorming stages because we want to do it well. And we want to make sure that we don't miss a step in this and that we get the support from all the sending families as well. I also think it's important that we support our current students sure. and we, uh, and we, and, and we identify who needs help and we offer that support immediate. We, the, the program I was referring to was in existence before the agri-science academy opened a lot of things just came to a halt with covid and then it's almost like oh yeah we did used to do that like there were a lot of things in place at that time and teachers had a lot of collaboration time to talk to each other and they don't have that structure so a lot of this is structural so we're working through that do we have a time frame I mean, like, how long do you anticipate something like this? I know that there's a scheduling part. committee that is happening right now, currently, because it'll have budget implications in the future. And so they're trying to meet all of the need. I just want to piggyback. Do you mind? I know you wanted to ask a question, but it was about this. So. Sort of along, along the same line. When we get kids coming in in ninth grade and they're coming from all of these different places and they want to which you in, they're obviously coming here because of the academic. I, I understand the ad kids are coming, you know, for ad. Do we do any type of screening and do we actually sit down with those kids and say, to the, well, to the parents, like, you're going to struggle. Like, we gave your kid a math test and we gave your kid an English comprehensive test and your kid is going to struggle to come into this school. They're obviously coming here because they want our education. If the parent or if the, if the parent says, no, no, I still want them to come here because I'll, for that reason, it's such a good school, then perhaps we do need some sort of a summer boot camp. But those teachers need to get paid. Right. And you know we're only charging $8,000 a year to come to this school. So there's a lot of you know, there's just a lot of implications that I think go into that. And I'm not saying we should be turning kids away, but I think we have to have kind of a reality check of you're coming in, you're not going to make it, Johnny, and that's not going to make you feel good. And you'll feel like we're doing you a disservice, but we're also doing a disservice to all of these other kids because our teachers are not going to let Johnny just go by the wayside and they're going to help him. Um, you know, I will say it, I've always said, and I, I told Mary and Mar today, you know, my son is at a very good university. He's a sophomore. He had a calculus test a couple of weeks ago. And I said, how do you think you did? He goes, everything on that test, I learned at Chicago. And I said, shout out to Mary and Mar. Um, so awesome. our kids are getting that education. And I understand everybody deserves that education. And I, I wish I had an answer. I don't. But how are we going to balance that to where our kids are not going to suffer? We are going to be able to take these other kids in because they want to be here because it's a great place to be. I don't envy 
any of you for having to do this. And I'm so grateful and so thankful that you are jumping on it. And we're, we're not, we're you. leaving no stone unturned. Like we're, this is difficult, but, it, but we have to talk about it. Nope. Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions that I have. We have math interventionists at the elementary school level. Correct. Do we have them at the middle school level? No. And we haven't for years. No. Why like is that? A, a, perhaps a tutor, a math tutor. Right. But if position. we're, so I'm just, and I'm speaking from experience. So yes. I'm not even talking about sounding, sending towns. I'm talking about yes. our, our yes, students. You're absolutely right. So they have, we have reading interventionists and yes. math interventionists. Yes. And certified math. In, in um, yes. elementary school. When they leave in fifth grade yes. and those students that have math intervention go to sixth grade, they no longer have it. That's correct. And it has been that way for years. We've never had a certified and why interventionist. Is that? At the, well, it was put in the budget as a request a few years back. But it, it's, it but, didn't pass. But it was taken out. So when I had a meeting with my son in fifth grade to go to sixth grade. And he had intervention in fifth grade. And I sat down with his, the staff and said, great. So what are we doing next year? And they said, well, we don't have math intervention next year. And I said, why? And they said, well, that's a great question, board member. And that's a fair question. So I'm asking you, after years, why have we not put that in? We're looking at the numbers. I don't know why we don't have intervention in middle school, which I would think would be the reason why in high school, these numbers would be better. It's and fun. this isn't, that. and respectfully, I'm just saying this across the board. We've never had that happen. To me, that would be the first thing that we should have been doing years ago. And we're sitting here tonight and we still haven't done it. And I kind of feel like my ears are getting hot right now because I'm outraged that that to me, and I'm not an education, I, 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 this is not my area. But the fact that I had to pay money out of my pocket in middle school to help my son outside of school when it wasn't supplied here, it's kind of an outrage that we're sitting here tonight still having the same conversation. And that to me is unacceptable. So I expect it's going to be included in the budget. It absolutely is. A, it, I'm going to tell you, I won't even support it at all in any way, shape or form if it isn't in the budget this year, because this is absolutely an outrage to me. Right, Mary, you have a follow-up question. Uh, this, I just want to tell Jen something that my kids came before your kids. And there was a math teacher there that she, if they, they were supposed to offer extra help after school or before school. And um, the teacher told my friend that if your kid needs uh, any extra help, then you're going to have to get a tutor. That was the way they thought back when my kids went to middle school. That, so, so that's just for that. Um, we, we, we do not have a certified, no, not for any of that. They're tutors. They're tutors. We had math tutors. We had ELA tutors. The, the other thing is that we're, we're bringing kids into the into our elementary schools too. And that can be skewing our numbers also. But also another thing that I remember us doing in, in 2018, we had block scheduling. Then came the pandemic and we did something different. And then they modified, did a modified block for the last, last year and this year, if I'm not mistaken. And it actually I don't- goes back longer than that because we had the block scheduled, but we did away with that. 2013. Uh, in 13. So it was ah, been gone okay. for quite a while. I thought maybe that might have uh, something to do. No, I doubt it. I doubt it. Justin, you have a I'm, question. More of a comment. I'm just not really comfortable um, placing a lot of the, uh, blame is the right word, 
on students not from our three. So. I I agree with you completely. I'm I'm not even. No, no. I know there, there's an implication in here on the concerns with the with the demographics. So my concern is um that we you know Bridgewater, Roxbury, and Washington own some of that failure as well. I mean, especially if you look at the data from the elementary schools, I mean, that's not sending towns. And I think it's just too easy to, to place blame on, you know, other districts. And quite frankly, I don't want to be a part of that. Um, yeah, Kate, I just I just want to say something about that because this is what's bothering me. Very if, uncomfortable. If, if you if you look at these numbers, the numbers in the middle high school that are that are down in the in the bottom end are numbers for six, seven, and eight. They didn't come here from sending town for ag science. They didn't come here from in general from sending town. Now there may be a small number of students who 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 have come through the system uh, who tuitioned in here, but it's not enough to have these impact. These impact numbers are coming from something that's not happening in our existing elementary schools. And I don't want anyone to think. Also, the other thing I should point out to you is that of the top five people in our in our class last year, two of them were from uh, out of uh, were ag sending towns. So I don't want to hear any of that. I want that talk to stop because that it, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's not accurate. And that's not what these numbers say. We've got a bigger problem because we're not getting it done in-house for the kids that start here in kindergarten that come from Roxbury, Bridgewater, or Washington. That problem has to be tackled. Like there's some really good professional development, and there's some like really really good in differentiated instruction. I'm just wondering how much that our teachers get of that because when it's really good, like the results are amazing. Well, they've definitely had a lot of training in that, and that's part of looking at our data teams and looking at student results, and they're going to restructure how they then now respond to students. I mean, everyone is laser focused on this, everyone. And so different, differentiated instruction means that we tailor our instruction to meet the needs of the kids we have in class, right? And we teach to those different students that we don't just fall on putting kids in, in tracks by ability, right? That's the old way that we do things. So Jane, differentiated instruction is, is absolutely um, a best practice. Um, we can't just say, oh, well, we did that in the past. People had this training. We have a whole slew of new teachers in front of kids who maybe weren't here when that training was delivered. And or if we're not seeing it being faithfully developed or implemented in the classroom, then maybe we need to circle back and do that or set expectations and work with our administration to hold people accountable to make sure that that's happening. But we definitely are going to teach the kids that are in front of us, right? Not the ones that we wish we had or we think we have or whatever. We're not going to make excuses about it. We can't blame kids from other towns. Our own towns are not performing in some of these spots, right? Um, if we want to have screeners and do a math boot camp, that's an excellent idea. Excellent use of funds. I would support that 100%. I think that makes a lot of sense. But we also need to, um, I think it's intellectually lazy to blame kids from other towns um, and say that that's the reason why. Uh, because if you do a root cause analysis, you usually ask the question why five times. So if you go down this you know, intellectual exercise and say, well, why are kids from other towns doing poorly? And there's an answer. Well, why is that the answer? Why is that the answer? All of a sudden it gets to be less about the kids and more about us and what we're doing or not doing to support these kids, right? So the onus is on us. This is our problem. This is our reality. We're accepting these kids, they're our kids, right? And we need to put systems into place to meet their needs. Um, and we need to work together to do that. And, you know, I, I've already expressed my thoughts with our, our staff here. Um, I have a lot of energy around this problem. I think there has to be a high degree of urgency around this problem. And we can't make, you know, these low level excuses about, you know, why the problem exists or worse, try to externalize it and blame it on something else. We have to look inside at ourselves and say, we have to have an honest conversation, put plans in, in place, visible plans that we can implement tomorrow to do a better job of each, each of these kids. We can't also say, oh, we'll wait until next year. We have real kids in front of us right now. Vicky, your kid is in our class. Angela, your kid, they go to our school, right? So we need to meet these kids' needs today. What is what are some of the problems? And two of the their honest problems they gave you are these kids are coming from out of district and they are not up to where they need to be. So yes, 
So, but you can't, you can't say, I don't want to hear that. That's the truth. Don't ask our teachers for the truth if you don't want the truth. And don't let parents go, well, I don't care, you know, head of the math department, if you think Johnny can't cut it in honors calculus. I, I the parent, want Johnny in, in honors calculus. Well, guess what? Johnny's failed. So you got to stop letting the parents override the people who know what the heck is going on with these kids and what they can do. So if you want to let, if you want a tuition kids in, give these kids an assessment before they come in and then have something in place so they have a boot camp or whatever it's going to be for six weeks to get you up to speed so you can hack it at Chapag and you're not doing that for $8,000 a year. Absolutely. And also, you're not doing it for, for right. I mean, oh, it, we have smart, attention. we have smart oh. after school, we have easy after school. But again, you're gonna have to reassess eight thousand dollars a year for tuitioning in when we, you know, education costs money. I I just wanted to ask the question that, and again, I I don't know. If, I'm sorry if this sounds like a silly question, but. Is there a model that other districts that are relatively our size that are doing well that we could, I mean, we, in terms of, in terms of education, right, you're all kind of leaning on each other. So if we're looking at other districts that are doing well, how are they doing well? And are we sitting down with them to look at what they're doing? And are we modeling that? Because I, I would feel like that would be a great start. So there's another there's, a, I'm going to answer your question as well. There's another chart, it's yeah. front and back, that shows um, all districts in Derg A, Derg B, and Derg C, right? Yes, yes. Even going back to when Todd Dyer was here, and Marianne will speak to it as well. We what, absolutely what, have called other districts. And, well, what are we, and are we constantly changing that? So when you're meeting with our districts and you say, wow, so and so is this district's really doing well, what are they doing? Yeah. And the so one thing we... that came out was that um, in many other districts, um, families do pay for kids to get extra coursework in preparation for SAT, for example. Which I told and why did we stop? Because I remember that SAT course. Well, why did it stop here? Because I do remember it was structural. I'm sorry, structural, well, schedule, the schedule, but COVID it was hit. Over weekends. I mean, I know Bailey got dropped off and she did it on a Saturday morning. Okay. That was not through us, but what we but, were, we were just a site. Right. But doesn't that benefit our students to have, to have it on site to be, because it certainly was convenient for me to drop my kid off for the court. Right. Right. So the and school organized, that. must've organized. I remember that. the big banners, yep. advertising. But those are opportunities for our students to be able to participate in outside of their normal schedule to take the SAT course or the PSAT course that, and they were packed. And I remember getting in trouble when, when Bailey would be like, mom, you didn't sign me up yet. I was like, oh my God, if I don't do it, it's going to sell out. So those for me, so I'm kind of, and again, those are no brainers that you could just offer that would encourage the students to continue to take those courses outside of their normal schedule. Yeah, and that's absolutely true, Jen. Um, and those courses are kind of icing on the cake, right? But they're not, we're not gonna tutor our way out of what happens in the classroom day in and day out, right? So we really need to focus on that, right? And I think we absolutely should pay for those courses. Absolutely we should. And I've said to the math department, we will pay for you guys to go out in teams for these other schools that we know are doing well, we have the results right here, talk to them, learn from them. You're absolutely right. Why reinvent the wheel? People obviously are, you know, solve this problem. Like, let's go and talk to them. Is it their materials? Is the, the math sequence? Is there, you know, something else? Are they devoting more or less time to this? Like, you know, to me, I think, you know, all solutions are on the table. So there, there's um, parental, there's kind of a, a running theme here of, of parental involvement here. What are we going to do as a district to get parents more involved um, regarding, you know, 
this deficit in, in uh, math. Certainly. So that was a discussion point as well. And we just talked about it at our committee meeting that it would be beneficial um, for teachers to reach out to families to say this is our focus of concepts in the next quarter and to really invite a communication and a partnership to revive that because I do feel that it was really strong at one time and it's not as strong today. Um, and so we need to extend that invitation and reach out. And so that is definitely something that we're also discussing. And I think it cuts both ways, right? So we have teachers saying, hey, we think part of the problem might be that um, parents aren't as engaged as we wish. But we also have parents saying, hey, I wish teachers would communicate more, right? So both sides are saying similar things. So to me, the solution is to bring them together in ways to close that communication gap. Um, I know that um, Dr. Shells and his team have put together um, a plan for parent engagement and climate and culture improvements in the school. Um, I'm going to ask them to present that in an upcoming board meeting. Um, but that is something that is already on their radar and they're all working on. But 100% accurate in, in, in terms of the fact that we have to close that, that communication gap. John. I agree with Angela um, in that uh, screening would, would definitely um, and possible a possible boot camp would definitely be uh, less of a financial burden than um, hiring interventionists and tutors and um, so it, for the students who may be deficient from out of district. Um, but I have a my concern is, could some of, and I don't even see it on here, the, the possibility that, could some of the concern be the actual program or the uh, curriculum itself? So it says the, the challenges of them accessing it, that it's hard. Yeah. It says it um, there as well. So let's see where it says. I have a, a neighbor who calls me up all the time. She has the equivalent of a sixth year in nursing. She can't help her grandmother or her granddaughter do math problems that that they're bringing home. I appreciate Dr. Goslin's sense of urgency here. And I sense it, I feel it, I hear it. And I think that everybody needs to feel that sense of urgency. Having an interventionist is bog not having one is boggling my mind. I feel your frustration. And it is imperative that we have that for these students. It is imperative that we act immediately, not it's on the table, not we're thinking about it, not we're contemplating it. We need to get these students help immediately. This is an urgent matter. And this is something we need to work on diligently. I'm not saying, and again, I'm going to piggyback what Angela said. I do not, I do not want to be in your shoes. What you're doing, what you are all doing for our students is amazing. I am so glad that I moved my child from Danbury up here. I cannot thank this district enough. But this is an we have so many urgent issues that we need to address. But we need to help these students with these math scores. We need to identify the students that need help. These students are internalizing. They feel they are failures. When we know as adults that they're not, but they feel they are failures. And these students need help now, yesterday. We need those interventionists in. We need tutors in here. We need to get these students up to par. We need to get these scores going. And it's just something I am very, very passionate about. 
is giving every student an equal opportunity. And if they are falling behind, we need to find the reason and we need to get them up to park now. And I'm sorry, I'm so passionate and I appreciate your sense of urgency. And I think everyone should have that sense of urgency. That, I mean, thank you. And this is, yeah, I, I've been on fire about this issue. Um, you know, and it's one that really, you know, it keeps me out of thinking my core, but to me also, we, you know, need to really focus on, on the data. So we've got a, a data warehouse that helps with this, right? And we're going to train our teachers in, in running reports out of that. So they're better equipped with this data. But I'll tell you a story. When I was a fourth grade teacher, I set a, a high school for my class. I said, on all of our tests and quizzes, my expectation is you're going to get an 85 or better. That's the expectation. So I set a clear expectation. They knew what the, the goal was. When a kid bought, failed to meet that, I sent a little half sheet of paper home to their parent and said, hey, just want to let you know your son or daughter didn't meet the expectation today, but they can retake this test as much as they need to to meet that standard. And I came in during recess and I worked with these kids. And lo and behold, with enough time and enough effort, every kid can meet the standard, right? So sometimes it's literally that simple. It's going back, finding who didn't get it, giving them the opportunities to relearn the material and make it up um, and get better. That's what we do in every other aspect of human development, right? And so I think we need to take this on and, and say that we have a better job in supporting these kids and getting them across the, the finish line. And we have some great teachers that already do that. We have some that, that stay here late into the evening working with kids, giving them the opportunity. But that has to be the norm. And we have to set that clear expectation. This is the level of standard we expect. And if we fail to meet that, it's either the, on the on the students, on the teacher, maybe it's both. But we have to, I think, set that expectation. Kids need to know it. Our teachers need to know it. Our parents need to know it. And then when we don't meet that, that gives us the opportunity to have a conversation and then get back to what we say is our minimum performance. Okay. Definitely. But you have something. Yeah. Uh... And I have so many questions. I mean, I'm actually almost scared to ask how exactly, since we haven't had interventionists that we're servicing students in the middle school. Um, you know, I've got a fifth grader rising sixth grader with some, I'd say math and security. And it's really concerning to me knowing that there wouldn't be that scaffolding for support <clears throat> to move up into the next grade level. Um, and, you know, to, to kind of question Mark's comment earlier about the faithful implementation of differentiated learning, I'd argue that's not happening, particularly the, at the elementary school level. Um, you know, I've got kids spanning kindergarten to fifth grade, and I see a variety of areas where that mm -hmm. is spoken about, but I don't think it's actually being implemented. Um, and again, at, at least at the elementary school level, there are interventionists to step in when that happens. Um, but looking at test scores, what I'd really like to see is a synthesis of what this data actually means. I mean, there are a lot of data points here and they kind of contradict each other at different schools and different grades and different cohorts. You know, when we spoke about this at our last meeting, you know, we, we wanted more of the information and the data to look at, but what I'd really like to see is what the analysis is. What are we really looking at? What is the plan to move forward? what does this data mean? Um, I mean, we can see the downward trend, but what are teachers saying? What are our administrators saying about why this is actually happening and what, are, what we're doing or what we could be doing differently? Um, because I just feel a real lack of a plan moving forward um, and a lack of action items. <clears throat> we all feel the sense of urgency and frustration about being at this point after three years of watching these numbers decline at the very least. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to have more information and bigger conversations about what we're doing in the classrooms um, and why we aren't meeting benchmarks that we used to meet. Um, not, I think the district data team, that's part of the role of this new team to do exactly that. It's not just about having all this information and access to data, but what does it mean and what actions are we going to now take to counter that? That's how are we creating the analysis though? I mean, it's one thing to have the data, but there's a way when you take this information where you distill it down into 
a particular action plan. You know, and there are different ways to do that. I just don't, I haven't heard yet what what pathways we're taking to do that with this information. We have ways to collect the data. But, so we're collecting data. I don't know if that's a statement or a question. I don't, I'm not sure where we're moving from that point. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose of the data team is to create those action steps you're talking about. Who's on that, who's on that team? It's a K-12 team with administrators and teachers from all levels that Mark created. First data team that we have. Well, at some point in time, you're going to be able to get through enough data to figure out what you're doing. You'd like, anybody to do it. You'd like an update and when you, when you figured out what steps beyond what's listed here need to be undertaken. And if you've undertaken steps that you detailed for us in this material, that would be why it was going to be top of, yeah, the mathematics review. If you have implemented things on there. We'd like to know whether or not they've been successful. Uh, and, and we'd like to see an updated report because obviously these, well, I mean, if you look at the SAT numbers versus the, versus the other numbers, the other testing numbers that you've got in, in this thing, with DIRGs, A, B, and C, um, if, if you compare the SAT math to the math scores that are on here, out of the 60 school entities on this list, only five of them did better on the SAT. The other 55 did worse. That, that, that's where our numbers really went into the dumper. And, and when you look at these numbers, basically nobody's numbers in our DERG are anything to write home about. Okay, so we're better than most of them. But we don't aspire necessarily to be as good as the towns or as good as the school systems in our DERG. We, we, we aspire to DERG A. And we're way behind. If that's, if that's what we're aspiring to, we look kind of silly <clears throat> aspiring to that because that, that, that's where our scores are way behind. Now, SAT, I can probably see it because what does the SAT measure best? The socioeconomic status of the community. That's what it measures best. And clearly, Derg A or that is the top in the state. The, the eight towns or the eight school systems in Derg A are the top in the state in terms of uh, socioeconomic status. So maybe if you're looking at SAT scores, that's all that proves. But the fact of the matter is, I, I think that our that the numbers in our DERG are very underwhelming and ours are, you know, even though we're sort of near the top, not quite at the top, it, it's, I'm not, you know, writing home about it. Yes, uh, Stephanie and then. Sorry, just because I, I meant to ask the question since we brought it up a few times. I thought we do have a selection process and interview process for our ag students and specifically to the point that, you know, years ago when we started implementing that program, we didn't want there to be, um, uh, you know, a, a high failure rate of kids that were coming into the district that were underperforming and that would essentially leave us before they could graduate because they weren't able to, you know, compete at this particular level. So I thought that was already a part of the interview process, but again, I'm not particularly there's no um, assessment that students take, and we're reliant on the documents that are shared from that district. The but documents as, include report cards. Right, but as we also, heard, there could be a discrepancy. And so just because it says it on a report card doesn't mean that that's the performance that the student can bring with them. But there's no screener, as far as I know, even with tuition and students, we don't assess them I, I, before we accept them. I'm sorry, but I think we're heading off in the wrong direction. <clears throat> we have always, in the, in the 15 years I've been on this field, we have always seen a market drop in, in standardized test scores between fifth grade and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. it is, it, it, we had that long before we even thought about bringing anyone to any other school district here. That's, a, that's an endemic problem that we've had, and we could, apparently haven't, haven't corrected it. Um, and and what, what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing underperformance across the board. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I don't like the direction when we start talking about what are we doing to assess people? What are we doing to assess our own people? Yeah. How do you make it from fifth grade to sixth? It, 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 you make it through the system. If at the end of the day, you're performing more at a lower level than you did when you were in elementary school. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something clearly wrong that we haven't figured out. And I'm not sure it's just us. And this could be across the board. 
And I'd also like to know what external factors are impacting this. Uh, is there a high level of anxiety produced by the, the, the needs to be outstanding on social media? I mean, is that part of what the problem is? Is it something like that? I'm not suggesting that's it, but I do believe that kids are massively anxious today because they have to see what they've been, what's been posted about them or what they're, what they're doing. And my God, I cannot imagine having gone through middle school and high school with that kind of environment. I'm no, thank you. I, I, I don't want to be any younger than me if that's what you have to do. Uh, but I, but I can tell you that, that there could be external factors that are making it exacerbated, that have made it worse than it otherwise. Normally it would be a, into the, a little bit into the dumper. And now we're diving into the bottom of the dumper because dumpster, because of the, you know, these other external factors. So I think you have to analyze that. I wouldn't miss that because that could be part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just a thought, uh, Jen, and then, uh, unless anyone has a massive, you know, let's try to wrap this up because we've got a whole bunch of other things. All right, I'll try to wrap it up. Hard to do. Um, I guess the other kind of question, and I think I asked this last time, Teresa, is that the the test re the test re scores you got last year that we that were not presented, correct? We didn't present. Did you present them last year? No. Oh, last they're right year. here. Twenty twenty two is right here. Right, but when you received them, there wasn't a presentation about the test scores. Is that right? Maybe I think because I remember not just going over it, and I guess for me, I, I I'm getting a sense of urgency now. But I mean, was there a sense of urgency last year when you received the test scores? I think that's when Megan had shared with the group that there were some concerns, right? But we were already seeing the um, the decline, and that's why the Institute for Learning became the partners. Mm -hmm. That was what we were going to try to utilize mm -hmm. to impact instruction in the learning environment. Right. And it's year three of that. And we're not seeing that investment on return. That's what we heard. And so we're now looking to say, we're looking at everything that's possible. But right away, there was um, an attempt to impact students in the classroom through that training with the Institute for Learning. Not to beat a dead horse, but I guess for me, give it a whack. I'll tr all right. <laughs> Twist my arm. Um, but I guess for me, the question is, is that I would think having an interventionist at the middle school level would really help the gap. And everyone's on the same page. But, but I guess the question is, is the, the dead horse part is that why is it never happened, right? So if we've had years of everybody asking that question, but it's never happened, it kind of is frustrating to me because we think, well, we're, we're trying this and we're trying that. But for, and I think about the parent component, right? But fifth graders before who have, who have plans mm -hmm. that sit down at the end of their fifth grade to talk about what ha you, that's your chance where you have every parent coming in with their, when their child is on, whether it's with a reading interventions or math and then being, and then being brought up to sixth grade and you're like, you're hanging. So, you, so all of these parents are told you don't have help next year, but we're going to do this, this, and this. this so I, yeah. I, I, I feel like we've, we've, we've lost huge moments of connecting with parents at the fifth grade and having zero net to catch these kids when they're in, uh, and they're in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then they're up to ninth to, uh, uh, through 12. And I, and I just kind of am scratching my head saying year after year after year, we're seeing the data, but that, and, and maybe it isn't the cure all, but it sure as hell is a nice place to start. I do know the program improvement request went in several years ago and it did not show up in the budget. Teresa, I would just, I would be screaming until. Well, there were a few years there when we were cutting stuff out of the budget to get it close to zero, which was a big mistake. Teresa, can you answer a question? Uh, when my, when I was on the board way back when, one of the things that was required, and I don't think it's required anymore, was the teachers that were, up here at Chapag were required 
and maybe it was in the primary school too. I don't remember that, but I remember it was definitely at Chicago. They had to come in 15 minutes early and yes, to fill part of their contract. And that was part of their contract. And that was supposed to Half be an hour before the school at, starts and 15 minutes and after. after. And that was what the, our kids were supposed to be able to go to them for extra help. And is that that's still in the contract? That is still in the contract as far so, as. So why don't we make them do that? I mean, it seems like we do have pro we do have help, but it's not being used. And it's not being said, well, you're going to do this. Now it's in your contract and that's what you need to do. I don't know if that's where the problem is, but we need, we need to figure it out. Okay, look, if we don't have anything else on this topic, I'd like to move on because we've got a long agenda. It's already past nine and in about 55 minutes, we're going to have to take a vote to stay in session past 10. So uh, unless anyone has anything else on this, I'd like to move to the next item on the agenda, which is also Dr. Debrito. And it is junior and senior survey results. And perhaps you can. So I did. Um, times, I can't figure out what it means. So um, this survey was put together after a suggestion from the last um, meeting when I was here about how important it is to students um, to do well in the SAT. Um, are there colleges seeking SAT or is it test optional? So there were questions that were put together right away. And I met with Sophia and share them with Don as well for them to look at the questions. And we went into classrooms to really just gauge from the students, what are they thinking as far as post-graduation plans? Would they like to meet more often with their counselor? And we certainly asked, you did see the questions in there about whether they're a college search is leading to colleges that require the SAT or whether it's test optional, um, how important is it to them? So you'll see the question in bold and then um, the yellowish colored responses are all seniors and the green were all juniors that responded. And then you'll turn and you'll see a question again in bold, you know, do you plan to apply to college? That's on page three. So just wanted to share with you that we went right away to conduct a survey. Um, there were a lot of students that are seeking additional meetings, additional help. I made copies of those results right away and met with Sophia so that students are getting time with counselors to plan for um, after graduation. So wanted you to get a sense of <laughs> responses because they were not, they were all open-ended. This was not a multiple choice test. No one pigeonholed any responses. It was all open-ended and the students were able to answer freely. Um, but as far as the specific question of SAT, high percentage don't see the value in it. And so I just wanted to let you know what those responses were. And we're working with students internally making sure that they do have post-graduation plans and that the school is offering the supports to meet those requests. Just a question on format. So each square is, is a different student. Exactly. So there are four across. Exactly. Line. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, so I think, sorry. I just took my own opportunity here. Yeah. Um, so under the question where, how important is the SAT to your college search? Does that question imply that it's specifically for the colleges they're looking at or just in general, like how important is it to take the SAT? Because it seemed to me the overwhelming response was not very important, not at all, you know? And does, is that at odds with what the district's position is on the SAT? Because it sounded like last time we had a discussion about the district's position was that it was important. We are encouraging. We want them to do their best. And it sounds like the majority of students are saying it's not important to them at all. So are they not hearing the message? Are we not encouraging? I don't understand what the disconnect is. Yeah, so that's what it sounds like, right? That was really concerning to me when I saw the responses here from the students because um, I think the district's position should be that the SAT is important. I'm not saying that we want to 
you know, live and die by the test or measure ourselves on one single assessment. But at the same time, I think it's foolish to say that the SAT doesn't do that. Um, even if your college doesn't require it, there are schools where it's optional. I can tell you that if I'm an, an admissions officer, I'm going to look more heavily on someone sending their SAT. If someone doesn't send it to me, I'm wondering, what are they hiding? Why didn't they want to send it in, right? So, um, and our most selective colleges still require it. And so I think we still want to say that this is important. I think we need to set a, a culture an expectation and then communicate this early, often and over that the SAT is important. Yeah, the, the teachers, yeah, like, the teachers in success in your future. Put that as a request to get support to elevate the importance of all the testing, all the state testing. So they did make that request. Administration is going to do that at the school level so that the messaging is coming from administrators as well as the teachers. Did we ask for, were there any discussions about from the student's perspective what that disconnect is? I mean, are they saying, oh, I'm hearing it, but I don't, it doesn't resonate with me? Or are they just not hearing it? I just, I don't understand from their perspective why literally not at all important, you know, is. That's why this information is so valuable. That's right. Because we have time right now to do that because they're going to be taking the, the current juniors are going to be taking the SAT in March. So we have time right now to address this. So it's, it was important to see those responses. Like we're not shying away from the reality of the situation and from what people are feeling and thinking. And I, I come over and I eat lunch every day with three or four seniors, right? So I'm trying to really get some feedback from the trenches, so to speak. What I hear from a lot of the kids is that they're, gravitating towards schools that are SAT option. Um, and so that's something that I think we can do with our job, maybe through our counseling department or through our work with our teachers to send messages to the kids to stretch themselves and not resign themselves to the fact that they have to go to schools that are that don't require our, our, our SAT option, that um, they should have a full spectrum of schools that are on the radar. Um, I also want to make a comment about like the list of universities that are or colleges or their after or postgraduate plans have seemed to change over the years too. That trend looks a bit different. School, uh, you know, kids aren't going to the same schools that we used to see reoccurring. Um, is that also a part of some of the school? Like there's a large majority of kids that are applying to schools where it isn't required. Is it because the well, list the, of schools have changed or? The number of schools that are becoming test optional has increased. That's the reality. I agree, but also li like the, the list of schools that are most selective, less selective, those have also, changed. the trend has changed. Honestly, yes. we're seeing many more of our students go to schools that are less selective. I think it's hard to see Sophia's presentation and not be impressed by that, right? Um, and, and see that a lot of our students were choosing schools that may be a little less selective. And so I think that has to be something that we as an overall school community try to um, stretch our kids. And, and again, I know college is expensive and I know that this is a, a kind of a contentious issue today, but I still think we should be trying to help them establish some reach schools and, you know, mid-range schools and some safety schools, not all safety schools. Um, I think we should be pushing our kids. And I know that if I had not had guidance counselors that maybe opened up some of those pathways for me, I would have struggled, right? Or if I ran to a counselor who said, oh, forget, forget it, college isn't for you, kid. My life would turn out very different. So I think we want to make sure that we're stretching those kids and giving them, you know, um, the belief they can go anywhere and do anything and that we're here to help and support them along the way. Uh, I can tell you, like, even at the elementary school level, I have parents that come to me who consider whether they send their kids to private school in our middle school or high school years, because they look at that list of where our students are going and they'll see the trend. And, you know, honest, I think Again, maybe that's a, a larger discussion we need to have with the community is what are the students' expectations? What are their parents' expectations? Where is there a disconnect? Because, you know, later there's a question regarding, you know, what your family's expectations are. And a lot of those say, yes, they have very, very high. strong, you know, high expectations. So, again, that might need to be a larger conversation mm -hmm. of, you know, our students are the ones ultimately deciding what their future is and where they're going. But what are the community expectations? What are their parents saying about it? Um, and I'm not trying to be elitist, but I completely agree. I think you're onto something there for sure. Well, there may also be. 
Some people may be proud of this. Why? What they did. Won't be enough. And our our. I think you the best school. There are plenty of public universities that are very rigorous and have high standards. We used to send a lot more kids to UConn than we do now. I mean, we're just saying it doesn't have to be, you know, an Ivy League private school that needs to be on the list. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm talking about selective or less selective that doesn't necessarily have to correlate to cost. Well, you know, a lot of people, I'm not sure if they get the right information. Now. But, I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, UConn is considered a public a lot of people don't realize that it's some of these public ivies out of state you spend less than you would to go to yukon in state the primary problem with yukon is it's very expensive to live there they, they don't have a lot of living options off campus. I mean, it's pretty much it's on campus and they're expensive. Whereas you can go, uh, you can go to other places that have tremendous off campus housing. And all of a sudden your, your annual bill for college drops by $3,500. And it makes a big difference to some people. So I think that there's a lot of, a lot of information about other potentially great schools needs to get out there because there's some tremendous ones that cost less than going in state. And the price, yeah, the price tag you see isn't always the price tag you pay, right? So if a school has a large endowment, they may give out a lot more aid. So even though you may get sticker shock initially, it may be actually cheaper at the end of the day to go to some of those schools than maybe one that looked less expensive but, but gives out less aid, right? So if Syracuse on paper is sixty five and somewhere else is forty, you say, wow, like that's a huge difference, twenty five thousand dollars. But Syracuse is going to give you enough aid that you're coming in at thirty five, you're actually up five grand, right? And so like that's something that. I think we have to do a good job of working with our kids to understand that's how the game is played. That's what I was going to say. I think that's the important conversation <laughs> to have is to let our students know that they can apply to some schools that might be more selective, but that there are options for them if there are scholarships available or what that fun what the financial impact looks like. Because to send them out to make those decisions without, I mean, I don't know that that's what ha that's exactly what's happening. But if we're saying that that's a potential reason, then I think we do need to do a better job about helping them select those colleges and universities. Yeah, okay, uh, Vicki. I think it's also really important to know that this is not just juniors and seniors that are talking about this. I have a sophomore who plays football. He knows he's not going to the NFL. He knows he's not going D1. But what I asked him the other day, I said, what is your goal? What do you want to do? He said, I want to help you and dad pay for college. And he goes, and I really want to do that by playing football it, and my academics, obviously. He said, but I know how much college costs and I don't want to come out of college having a six figure debt. I don't want to do that. So I need to learn how I can go about helping you and dad pay for college without coming out with a quarter of a million dollars in debt from my undergraduate degree. So I think... I think that we need to educate not just juniors and seniors. I think we need to start at a younger age and we need to um, educate parents as well. I was told with my older son, in order for me to get good financial aid, you know, a good amount of financial aid or to help my son pay for his whole college education, I needed to sell all my houses. I needed to liquidate all my assets and put everything under my mattress. That's exactly what I was told by a financial aid person who came and gave a big presentation at my son's high school in Danbury. Well, so, you know, I just think I think that education is key for the parents, but also for the students and not just juniors and seniors. I think we need to do it at a younger age. And it's important that they know their options, scholarships, different things that you were just saying. You know, one, one of the things that I think that makes a big difference is if you can find just the right school for you. And that's not easy to do. And I, I, we're not telling kids that are serious about university that they need to start investigating it the summer after their sophomore year, not the summer after their junior year, but the summer after their sophomore year. They need to be making trips and visiting universities. And I know that's not always easy for a sophomore to figure out what's going to happen in three years. But you, if you wait too long, you're going to have narrow choices and you're not going to have as many choices. So I think we maybe want to encourage people 
to start looking a little bit earlier. I think that makes a lot of sense. But for both of my kids, we started in sophomore year. And um, we wanted to find just the right place. And I think we did in both cases. We started last year after freshman year. Wow, you're very ambitious. We absolutely did. And that wasn't my, I didn't pressure him. He wanted to do that. We went to visit schools. We went to visit, We he talked to students. He's on, you know, online talking to people. It's, it, you know, we have to light that fire under these kids so that they understand, so they can ask the question and know that it's okay to ask these questions at a younger age. I would suggest that you have lit that fire. <laughs> it's roaring, yeah, it's definitely. That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, this is really good information. I think um, uh, there probably are a few other questions you might want to ask the next time you do this uh, to follow up on some of these issues. But I, I think the more data we have, the better. Now let's figure out what to do with it. Right. Um, okay. <clears throat> now we have got all of the thing that, that the committee uh, on policy was doing, and we'll try to make this as painless as possible. There are 11 policies, 10 of which were existing policies that have been amended, and one of which uh, is brand new. The primary changes to a lot of these policies are law-based changes that, uh, if you recall, our policies are prepared by Shipman and Goodwin, our legal counsel. And so when there's a change in the law, they're right on top of it, and it changes our policy. So most of these are related to that. I don't know if you've had a chance to look through them, but you received two set, uh, two copies of each policy. One of them was the, the one with no marks on it was the existing policy. And the one that's all marked up in red or blue is the, is the policy, is the, is the, are the change, showing the changes to the policy that we're going to do. So we're going to start with number 1201, which is a non-discrimination uh, policy. And uh, what it does primarily is, um, it, it, it makes some changes to make the language flow a little bit better. Uh, and it also adds another, it also adds additional, um, additional um, protected classifications. Uh, C Connecticut is one of the, is, is the state that has, I think almost more uh, protected classifications than almost any other. And so they've added some new ones that have come into the law uh as a result of changes so i don't know if anyone has any questions or comments on this um but that's what this policy is and the, the policy committee recommends that you uh approve this for a first reading yes john it might help to know has shipman reviewed the edits these are shipman's edits these are shipments yes okay thank you yeah these are all shipments edits um this is the first reading for all these. This is the first reading for all of these. Uh, if, if you look at the last page of the marked version of policy 1201, you will see that there are several amendments to statutes that have caused the changes to this. Uh, even the reference to the Boy Scouts in here is, is there's a Boy Scouts of America Equal Access Act. Um, and so that, 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 and that's why they're mentioned in here. Uh, there were changes to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act of 73. Um, Connecticut general statutes added gender identity or expression as a protected classification. And then there are several other statutes that have changed. And there were a couple of tech, the technological changes in here as well. And, uh, and also a desire to express things better, to give better, better um, information. Uh, the other thing I would say is that Connecticut also added the victims of domestic violence as a protective classification. And so there's a lot of definitions in here related to that. And so that's what these changes are. They're all uh, they're all OK changes, um, bringing our policy up in line with current law. So is there if there's if there, is there a motion to uh, approve for a first reading the uh, policy 1201? Is there a second? OK, moved and seconded um, discussion. Questions. You, we, something is brought before us that we know little about. I mean, legally. Uh, so we we hire an attorney to, to vet it out. Correct. So. And that's what they've done. Right. So, do we need to do anything more? 
been just approved. Well, we need to adopt these as our, we, we need to adopt them as our policy. And we want our policies to be current with the law. Uh, I mean, we look through these things and if there was something in here that was weird, or if there was an option, some, in some cases on these policies, they gave us options and we elected to approve certain options and not approve others. When we get to those, there's two, I think two of the policies are like that. We'll get it. But on this one, these were all updated changes in the law and we saw no reason not to agree with them. I mean, we want to be in compliance with the law. And, and the, the, the idea of the policy is, is if there is, we want to make sure that our staff is able to understand and know when they have to deal with something. Uh, and, and by having the latest legal things, we don't have people that fall through the cracks and result in litigation or other problems uh, as a result. Um, but uh, so in any event, that, that's what these changes are to this particular policy. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining, please let me know that you're abstaining. Okay, this has been approved for first reading. We'll move on to 2501. This is retention of electronic records and information. And what the primary change of this has been to, we, we used to talk about certain uh, technological things like an email system and other things. And what we're doing is we're expanding that to create not just email, but any electronic messaging system. So that could that, that could include texting and other things because technology has has really moved away. I mean, email was was the, was the coolest thing back in the 1990s when I think it first came in. But now um, uh, we've got a lot of other stuff. So this was updating this. Um, and also, I will point out that it has broadened the number of people that have to comply with it, and it includes us now. So we are on the list of people that have to comply with this, this policy. So one thing I want to caution people is if you get an email on your personal email server, you know, like let's say you have your own email account and you are discussing school business on your own email account, you might have to produce those emails in the event someone makes a FOIA request. Please don't use any other system for school board business but your, your school board account. And the reason for that is, is every email that you send on your school board account is captured and put in our system so that in the event it's retained, we, we, we keep those so that in the event someone makes a FOIA request, we can um, respond to it with all the information that exists. So I would strongly urge you to limit your school board emails to that so that they're captured. If someone sends you one on your home email and you you respond to it without thinking, copy your copy that message, that response onto your school board account so that it gets into the system. It's very important that we have proper record keeping. And also don't put anything in an email that you do not want to see on the six o'clock news or in the newspaper, because it is everything that we do, unless it falls within the very narrow, it, uh, things that are protected by things like attorney client privilege or something like that. Very narrow categories, the huge multi, you know, if, if, if a, a one shelf of books is what's protected, the rest of the library is, is what's available to the public. So you need to think before you write and before you say something. And because, and because you are, you are also have to comply with all of this, this electronic restored stuff. So don't, you know, don't delete things. They need to go into the system. They need to get into our system. And you don't have to worry about deleting an email on your school board account because the, the account, our computer system still retains it even after you've deleted it from your personal account. It doesn't get deleted. It's there. So think about that. Make sure you comply with this. Is there a motion to approve the changes to policy 2501? 2500.1. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying, unless anyone has any questions. All those in favor, say aye. All those opposed, nay. All those uh, abstaining, please indicate. Okay, this policy has been approved for first reading. Policy 40, proposed policy 4118.4. This is employee use of the district's computer systems and electronic communications. This applies to our employees. And this again, 
getting rid of certain, <laughs> such as wireless or portable handheld electronic. We got rid of all that. It's it's now electronic messaging systems, computers, internet access, all of these these types of, of uh, things, including Bluetooth speakers, personal gaming systems, all this other stuff has been added. So this was updated because of technology. Those are the primary changes to 4118.4. Is there a motion to approve for first reading? Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Say nay. All those abstaining? So indicate. I see none. That one's approved. This next one is policy 5113. This is an amendment to our student attendance, truancy, and chronic absenteeism policy. What this did is it just added two other resources of uh, state resolutions and an education memorandum. Otherwise, it didn't change. So uh, all those, uh, uh, we have a motion to approve this proposed policy. I moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining, please so indicate. Seeing none of those, this policy has been approved for a first reading. Now we'll move on to 6141.321. This is the student's use of the district's computer systems and internet safety. And this made the changes to, to bring in modern electronic things. Uh, and that's pretty much it. It's it just, just updating it to which one you do. Did I miss one? Yeah. What What did I miss? 51, 50, 41, 23. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. It got stuck for that one. Uh, it grabbed its paper clip. Sorry about that. 5141.23, students and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act uh, and the American Disabilities Act changes. Uh, this makes some very modest uh, changes to the policy. Um, it, it, it talks about um, to fulfill our obligation, we recognize a responsibility to avoid discrimination in policies and practices regarding its personnel, students, et cetera, et cetera, which may require reasonable modifications to such policies. So we're talking about the possibility that we may need to adjust our policies to make reasonable accommodations for people under the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This is something we already knew, but we're getting it into the policy to make it clear. Uh, and also, um, there have been some updates and changes from the Office of Civil Rights and other places that have informed us to make sure we understand uh, that we need to make reasonable accommodations. Also, there's there's just a change in wording. It said, if the parent slash guardian of a student disagrees, and it now says, if a student's parents parents slash guardians disagree. I mean, that's really a question of, of language, of making it read more I guess putting it into English. Um, so that those are the changes. Do we have a motion to approve the changes to 5141.23 for our first reading? Moved. Is it seconded? Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All those abstaining, please so indicate. That one's approved. Now, 6141.321. And this is students' use of the district computer systems and internet safety. Again, we're modernizing it for the type of devices that we have. We've also included for your information, if you recall, there was a, uh, a question that a parent had um, uh, raised an issue about our policy and, and they were you know, a little bit unhappy with it. And, and the policy actually was a righteous policy and that, should, that they weren't unhappy with. What they were unhappy with was, was the form was requiring them to indemnify the school district if the kid violated that their kid violated the policy. That was not what we intended to do. And several years ago, we deep sixed that form and replaced it. Unfortunately, the form that was made available for the parents was the old form and not the new form. So we have corrected that situation. That parent has written back to us and said they're absolutely happy. We did it the right way. Everything was right. This was a case of the best intentions of mice and men. Uh, frequently go awry. Uh, I used to know the Gale, the, uh, the, the, the better language for that, but nonetheless, we fixed that problem. Attached is the form. All we're asking the parent to do is to acknowledge the policy because we want to make sure that students don't do things like post materials that are obscene or otherwise problematic. 
and we don't want them to be hacking into our system or using our our system for nefarious purposes and believe it or not the kids actually understand this policy and they know what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do is what i'm informed so this is no shock or surprise but now we've got it straight with a with an updated policy so that you know they know it's more than just uh, their ipad and chromebook it's it, there are other devices that might come into play so that's what this policy is do i have a motion to approve the amendments to 6141.321. Move is second. Seconded. Discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining, please so do so. I see none, so that's approved for a first reading. Policy 6144.1. <clears throat> These are curricular exemptions. These are the things that you can opt out of. All right. The addition was firearm safety programs. That was added this year. Um, we don't have any firearm safety programs. We don't teach this. So we're putting it in here because if we did decide to teach it for any reason, we don't want to have to update the policy. In public. Uh, because if we decide to do that, it's because there's a serious need to do it. And so we wanted to make sure that we were ready to handle that. And that's why that item was added in there. This was an option. We didn't have to add it. It's not required that we teach it and we don't teach it. Um, the other thing we changed in here is that we said that parents who wish to exercise an exemption must notify the school district in writing. It used to say within the first two weeks of school. And now it says in advance of the instruction to be provided. It's a little bit arbitrary to say in the first two weeks of the school, if the instruction's not happening until later. So now just before the instruction starts, let us know you want to be exempted. It's kind of hard to be exempted after we've given the instruction. So <laughs> this shouldn't be terribly controversial. And there were some legal changes as well. Um, and also the idea is, is that should we, should we engage in a, have a firearm safety program, it's important to have the right to be exempted from it because we know that that would likely be somewhat controversial. So actually it allows people to exempt themselves from that program. It adds that to the list of programs that be exempted. So it doesn't really, it, it, it's a pretty it's a pretty neutral policy that doesn't create issues or problems or, sh or shouldn't create much controversy. So is there a motion to approve the changes to 6144.1? Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? I hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining, please abstain. So we indicate. Okay, that was approved for a first reading. We got three more, four more. 6172.6. This is credit for online courses. And um, the primary change uh, is we're saying beginning with July 1, 22 school year, um, we're authorizing the district to offer remote learning for students in grades nine through 12 in accordance with this policy. And commencing July 1, 2024, the board offices the district to offer remote learning for students in grades kindergarten through 12 in accordance with this policy. Um, perhaps Mark, you would do a better job than me of explaining why we have been here. So, <clears throat> fundamentally this says two things. Um, First and foremost, it cleans up the language that was um, included around COVID and distance learning, right? Um, they had to make that count. And so at that time, the policy was revised. Now that that's no longer with us, it doesn't make sense to keep that on the books. But um, it is adding an option um, that would extend to remote learning and allow that to count for school um, if there are students who... Um, would elect to, or the families would elect to go that route. Um, what's happening right now is the state of Connecticut is actually in the process of creating, which would ostensibly be um, the latest district in the state, which would be a, a virtual school district that will offer an online schooling option for students who uh, maybe are school phobic, who have anxiety, um, who are high level athletes or child actors who might need flexibility in their educational programming. Um, and so, that would allow them the opportunity to um, offer a state-sponsored um, online school. It also helps close the loop 
for um, outside actors to come in and open virtual charter schools, which we've seen prol proliferation of in other other states. Um, and so that's what this policy does. It gets rid of that COVID language and just says that um, in the future, when that online um, district or online school is developed by the state, that that would count for um, sufficient credit for students who elect to go there. And and there's an option in this which sets forth a whole set of standards on on remote on, on this, this this related to this uh, what Mark has just said and the concept of remote learning. So that's all new stuff. Um, we we think it's a good policy. It's interesting. What we did find out from COVID is that there are some students who actually do better in the remote environment than they otherwise would do in an in class environment. So we want to make sure we have the ability to provide the right education for all students based on their individual circumstances, because uh, we never know. And it was funny, we were taking a bet at the time that some kids who maybe have a little bit of difficulty interacting with their kids might do better with online. Son of a gun, it turned out to be correct. And so we should always main everything we can do to give every kid the best chance of succeeding. I think we should do it. So I'm good with this. Uh, is there a motion to approve 6172.6 as a member? Okay, it was moved over here. You want to make a second? Sure. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion. Young. These online courses, who, who, who subsidizes them? Uh, well, we have we have virtual high school here. That's one of the online courses. So that, and okay. That's one of those things where we pay for it, but you would otherwise have to you would otherwise have to have one like like if you had I think one year we had one person who took some foreign one of the foreign languages. You would have had for them to take that, you would have had to have a teacher to do it. So it's a lot less expensive. We also had a situation in which one of our world language teachers taught German, I think, on that system, and that gave us 20 some odd free seats. So it's sometimes it's self-subsidizing. If you can get teachers here to do virtual high school, uh, then then we get free seats. And so we don't have to pay for it. But but that's something that the district picked up because for our for our money, the idea was we were paying, but we were also expanding the course offerings, which for a small school made us more attractive to people if we could teach those languages. Actually, one of my daughters took, took German online. She, she also took French in class, but she took German online and said it was great. I mean, she really she really had learned a lot. Because the, the school doesn't exist yet, the state was ordered to explore this and create one. Um, there's no talk yet about the financial model or what that might look like. Um, based on what I've seen, I think Nicole and I would probably venture to guess it probably would not be in our best interest the way that they would, um, you know, bundle that financially. But um, the board would at that point could also then um, create their own um, policies around uh, eligibility. So that there may be other options down the road to revisit this too. We're going to have to keep an eye on it. It shouldn't. I think you're right to be concerned with cost because rare, rarely does a new program come about that the taxpayers don't pick up the cost. Um, that's the way government works. So, uh, with all the talk about college expenses, once this catches on, it's, it's going to be, you know, if for as far as space and availability, I can understand and, and you know, with their schedules. But, um, but the good part about it is they can do it on Sunday, whenever. You know, so. Well, the, the one thing I can say is that if, if people are really concerned about the cost of a university education and, and, their, and their students that are able to participate in the classes, the UConn classes and others that are offered here, they should do it. I mean, uh, they had that available when my wife went to high school and she basically had an entire year of college done before she left high school, still went for four years. But nonetheless, she had that option to take to take that one year's credit and not have to go. So, so it does shave off. And when now the college is a lot more expensive than it was back then, uh, I could see that that could be attractive. To people. And so we should we should very much encourage them to take those classes to get that college credit. What's the worst that could happen? You could go to college with a year of credit and place out of certain classes and be able to take a more interesting course of study. I mean, you win either way. And so why not? Anyway, I'm glad that we offer that. Okay. Uh, is there, we've got, do we have a, we have a motion to, do we have a motion to approve? We have a motion to second it. Okay. Further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining, please so indicate.
Okay, that one's proved. 6173, enrollment in advanced courses or program and challenging curriculum. Gee, what were we just talking about? Um, th this The changes to this one are primarily on eligibility. There's an option on the eligibility criteria to say students will be eligible to enroll in advanced courses or programs through their high school career, even if they're not identified as eligible in grades eight or nine. See, there was this idea that you had to be identified in grade eight or nine and you could go to these programs. So you kind of got tracked. And now what we've decided you know, with, with the policy you know, and, and the direction is, is why should you not get a second bite at that apple if you are qualified? Why should you have seventh, uh, eighth grade be the determining of whether you get into one of these programs? You might have a, a different attitude. You might have a different capability. I mean, there's a lot of things and we thought it didn't make a lot of sense to, to keep people out, to say, oh, you didn't make the cut back then, therefore you're done. So I think this is a, something that allows a, a greater thing. I mean, you, you, know, you still have to qualify. It's just the question is, if we didn't identify you in grades eight or nine, can you have another shot? Um, and the other thing we're looking for eligibility is a student's prior academic performance is determined by evidence-based indicators of how the student will perform in an advanced course or program. And the district administration may in its discretion identify and publicize additional criteria including but not limited to student or parent request. Any such criteria should be established prior to commencement of the academic term. I mean, we would hope that we didn't have a situation where a parent would request that their student take a class that they just had none of the background and ability for. We would hope that they would instead get them trained up to the point where that class would be, they would gain more from it. I mean, we, you know, but, but we, we could state these criteria. We'll have the ability to do that. Um, Let's see, we've also said that oh, okay. Gee, I I, I thought it was something from the gallery. Um we also added this provision specifically the board recognizes that academic achievement and engagement in middle school are strong precursors to high school success. The board recognizes the importance of engaging with the students' parents and her guardians throughout the students' educational experience. Uh, reducing barriers to opportunities for advanced courses and programs and providing a wide range of courses. So we are recognizing that. Therefore, we had better follow through the school administration on interfacing with parents earlier on this. Uh, add that to the the, um, the fall program where parents come in and meet their kids' teachers. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the changes to 6173? There's second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion or further materials coming out of the computer that we might want to listen to? <laughs> all, right. all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. All those abstaining, please abstain. Okay, there we go. It's approved. 6201, parent-teacher communication. There are some minor changes to this. Um. Again, there are language differential changes. Then there's this thing where it says on or after January 20, 2022. Well, we're past that. So we cut that part out. This procedure goes forward. And there was, uh, I guess, an act that got repealed or something because it disappeared. Um, so that it's really both technical changes. So all those, uh, is there a motion to approve 6201? So moved. Is there a second? Yeah. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed. All those abstain. It's unanimously approved. I'm getting punched too. Don't feel bad. Okay, here we are. New policy. It will be in the 6000 series on instruction. A policy for the equitable identification of gifted and talented students. I would point out to you that this is not just students who have are gifted and talented in terms of um, uh, academic studies, it also includes um, the, the arts, music, theater. So it's the art, the outstanding talent, the creative arts. So um, I don't know. I don't know that this means a whole lot because I don't know that we're prepared to do anything. And we had a long discussion of policy. And 
I think the point is, is it puts a framework in place that we might one day want to identify gifted and talented students and have programs for them. But once you, I, if, once you put a program in place, you have to actually do something. With it. So it raises some interesting questions. Like, for example, if you happen to be a talented vocal performer, does the, does the school have a program for you? And they probably don't, because how many of these are you going to have? And so are you going to create a program for them, or are you going to provide outside enrichment? Uh, I would love to know whether or not all those music lessons that I took my daughter to in Harlem uh, to learn how to sing jazz would have been picked up by the school if she had been identified as a talented and gifted person. Apparently not, so I'm not holding my breath that uh, that if I have another kid come along, which ain't going to happen, I would I might uh, I might get something out of it. But no, seriously, that that was really the the primary discussion, which is this is a lovely program, but are we really prepared to go down this road? And I'm not sure we are yet. So I'm going to leave that to the administration to explain to you why we're asking you to adopt this. Your your court, Mark. Well, the policy is less about creating a program for students if they're identified in those areas. Um, you know, we don't say someone is gifted only in math and so you only have a gifted math program. Giftedness is a um, a designation that or a label for students um, based on certain criteria. Um, in the past, the only way that students who are identified as gifted uh, was through academic measures, um, IQ tests, that type of thing. This policy follows the uh, state and federal movement to expand who qualifies for giftedness um, by saying that there's alternate routes to identify a child as gifted, not just an IQ test, uh, but that now we can also look at things like if a student um, is talented in the arts or music, they could also uh, qualify for gifted um, programming as well. Uh, so it just expands the the process for being able to identify gifted children. Um, the programming uh, may support their giftedness if we say that they have some special abilities in those areas, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the program has to be. So it just allows a wider net to enter into the gifted and talented pool um, for students who um, would require some extra enrichment. Um, Connecticut doesn't provide um, a separate, what we call a GIEP or gifted IEP like other states do, um, but we would certainly want to um, program and meet the needs of students who, who are gifted uh, because they, like students who have learning difficulties, also sometimes find themselves bored and um, that can lead to um, other problems in school as well. So we want to make sure that we're meeting their needs um, and helping give them the right amount of stimulation and challenge in school. Is this your first reading or is this adopting it? No, adopting it for first reading. It's, it's first reading. All of these, all these tonight are first reading. So is there a motion to adopt this policy um, unnumbered yet in the 6,000 series for equitable identification of gifted and valid students for a first reading. I, so, I second. Moved and second. Is there further discussion? Further questions? Further kibitzing from the sidelines or the computer? All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All those abstaining, please so indicate. That is done. Now, um, that's pretty much it for the agenda. We have an executive session, but what's going to happen is, since it is five minutes or six minutes of 10, we are going to run into our 10 o'clock thing. So I'd like to ask for, for a motion to extend our time this evening past 10 o'clock, no later than 11 o'clock. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, all those abstaining. All right. Um, do I have a motion to go into executive session for discussion of superintendent evaluation? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed. We have the two. We have the two-thirds vote. Okay. And I assume no one abstained.